I often have strange things happen to me. This time, it was on my recent trip to Tanzania for a midwifery internship. One weekend that I was there, I went on safari in Ruaha National Park. On the safari itself, it was only the guide and I. However, afterwards I was staying at the hilltop lodge in a small hut-like room. It was a peaceful lodge, overlooking Ruaha Valley. One particular night I was there, I fell asleep as usual, but I was awakened to the sound of clicking from heels on a hardwood floor. They were coming toward me. As soon as I opened my eyes, I heard a woman say, How can you sleep here? I turned to look to my right because that's where the voice came from. I couldn't see much, but I did see a black shadow right next to me on the edge of the bed. The shadow then fell into my stomach or hip area, at least that's what I felt. I felt the shadow go through me, and I felt the bed compress next to me. Keep in mind, I was alone. I checked the time, and of course it's 3am. I was in Africa, by myself. There wasn't anyone to talk to about what just happened. So I thought, stupidly, that I would reach down where there was an indentation in the bed. I don't really know what I was trying to accomplish. Maybe something was there. Nothing. I was pretty scared. I wanted to turn on the lamp that I had next to the bed, but that didn't happen. All these events happened fairly quickly, within five minutes. After I felt around, the strangest thing happened, and all of a sudden my head was back and my eyes had shut. I knew that I was falling asleep. I also knew that I wasn't purposefully trying to get back to sleep. My body began to go numb in a systematic kind of way. First my head, then my chest, and so on. I tried to scream because I thought maybe the lodge owners would hear me and would be able to help. I was in sheer panic. I managed to whisper scream. That's all I could get out. I screamed three times and I realized that it wasn't going to work. I gave up and was propelled into a dream. A nightmare, rather. The black shadow had possessed me and was in my mind, speaking to me. She told me that I could do things with my mind when she was there. I found I could open doors and start fires just by thinking about it. It was cool, but really terrifying. I had to find a way to get her out. She wanted me to do terrible things, and she wanted to consume my soul. I spent a majority of the time trying to figure out what I could do to make this demonic being leave. I knew I could have an exorcism, but I couldn't find a priest to do it. I pleaded with her, begging for my soul, screaming that my life was of value and that there were things that I was meant to accomplish. I would be incapable of said things with this demon possessing me, but it wasn't working. She didn't care. My body was her vessel now. The end half was an endless search in a sanitarium-type hospital, looking for a different vessel. I thought that maybe, if I could find somebody who was brain dead, it would be the best idea, if you can call it that. I don't know how the dream ended because my alarm went off. It was so realistic, and I do believe in the paranormal. It was so real, I had to make sure that I couldn't still do things with my mind once I woke up. I will never forget this experience. So this all started at the age of eight. My family moved a lot due to my father's job. So we had just arrived in South Africa. And about a month after arriving there, my parents found a beautiful house, big and magnificent. However, three weeks after moving in, I wake up at three in the morning. Next thing I knew, I was hearing a man singing. I open my window to hear him better, and through the leaves, because of course there was a tree so I couldn't see anything, 
I see an African man wearing a purple boo-boo. He kind of looks like my grandfather, so he didn't scare me at first. However, at one point he stops singing, and I can feel his eyes piercing through the leaves. I quickly close my window and put myself under the sheets. Force field, I guess. Right after that, he starts singing again. The melody, I've tried to look for it for years now. It's like it's tattooed on my brain. Anyway, it only happened once whilst in South Africa. I had a lot of other spooky shit happen to me there too, but it's unrelated to this story. This was in 2008. Fast forward to 2015. I'm out at one in the morning in my town, just walking and appreciating the silence of the night. At one point, I hear a faint whisper. At first, I thought it was the wind. Nope. The melody starts again, and it seemed like he was singing, standing a couple of meters from me. Except I was on a road, and one side of it had a river. The other side just had an empty space, just dirt and some grass for about an acre. I remember looking around and could kind of spot him in the corner of my eye, still rocking his purple boo-boo. I panic and I yell at him to stop, but it goes on. I start running to my house. It was about two kilometers away. I'm no runner and I have practically no endurance due to anemia. But believe me when I tell you, I sprinted for a good 10 minutes. I stopped at about 200 meters from my house, completely exhausted and spitting my lungs out. I felt weird for a moment because I was basically crouching, taking a breath, and it's like everything stopped. I heard him sing again. I took whatever energy I had left to get back to my house. I slept with the lights on for about two weeks. Now I'm 19, and I kind of forgot about all of this until three weeks ago. It was about 8 o'clock. I went out early to buy some cigarettes, and I was walking back home. As I did, I passed through a park. Lo and behold, he sings again. This time I start thinking that I must have episodes or something, but cars are passing literally a couple of meters from the fence of the park. So this time, I keep my cool and tape recorded on my phone. Then I try something. I take my headphones and put them on, without music. Although the sound from the outside world is muffled, I can still hear him singing, but muffled, just like the sound of my environment. So it's not from my head. I take them off and head back home, checking behind me every so often. Once home, I take my phone and listen to the recording. Blank. Absolutely nothing on the tape. So I just go on with my business. At this point, I didn't give a damn anymore. In and of himself, he doesn't really scare me. Like I said, he reminds me of my grandpa. I'm half French and half African. However, it's just so startling each time. And this damn melody... Sometimes, I catch myself singing it. I know that he will come again at some point in the future, but next time, I want to be ready. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I will. My family and I always led a pretty exhausting life. I was busy with school, they were busy with work and bills, so we barely ever got breaks. However, during the holiday school break in around December, my father decided that it would be best if my half-sister and I went to a secluded cabin in Alaska. His mother had bought it when they were fleeing the war in their country in order to relieve some stress she has three kids who are already married and have children of their own, so she was supposed to take care of me. Everything went fine when we arrived there, and we slept in the same upstairs room, except my bed was in front of the class doors leading to the balcony, and hers was right by the door. It was around 2 a.m., 
and I was still awake, using up all of my mobile data to chat with friends who also had trouble sleeping. We were on Instagram. Suddenly, I heard a loud thud that jolted me to my senses. My half-sister only rolled over in the bed and complained about the sound, but then she fell back asleep. Once I made sure that she wasn't awake, I quickly abandoned my bed and opened the glass doors, and then went out onto the balcony. It had a small wooden chair with a mug that my sister was drinking coffee from earlier. At first I saw the other cabin, where an elderly couple was staying with their grandchildren and two big German shepherd dogs that slept outside. So I thought they may have knocked something over, because the couple had big barrels outside of their house for some reason. But something else caught my attention, and it wasn't anything ordinary. It was a figure of a woman who walked calmly out of the forest surrounding the trail that led to the small bundle of cabins there. When I noticed her, she looked straight up at me, and I immediately bolted back inside. I forced myself to sleep quickly that night. I woke up at around 4 a.m., and I had to go to the bathroom, but I was too lazy to stand up for a while. So, I rolled over, and the first thing I see is a woman with all gray features, despite there being a light outside, tapping on the glass. I just ran quietly toward the bathroom because I was still feeling sleepy, and when I came back, I noticed that she wasn't there. I got creeped out, so I woke up my sister, who checked everything, including downstairs, but there wasn't anything there. I remember that the dogs barked a lot that night. The next morning, I told her about that, and she asked me if I was sure that it wasn't just a bad dream, and then promised to call the police if the woman kept showing up. It was two days later, and we heard a lot of barking, but never saw a woman. My sister invited the couple over for coffee. I remember that the old man also mentioned seeing a woman outside who was digging in the snow and dirt with her hands in the middle of the night. When he yelled, what are you doing here, loudly at her, she just ran off into the forest. Nothing really happened later except the power going off and on constantly, the couple's dogs acting really strangely and footsteps in the snow that weren't there before, showing up in front of our cabin. We wrote that off as other people staying at the cabin looking at ours when we went out grocery shopping, though. What I remember clear as day, however, is that when I was upstairs playing with the old couple's grandchildren once, the mug that was still on the balcony, because my sister had forgotten it there, just flew off and shattered despite nobody being there to do it. Afterward, the dog started barking again. It scared me so badly that I took the kids downstairs. When we returned home, though, my mother jokingly said that maybe the place is haunted. And that seriously has me thinking that it really is. Is there something paranormal about this? Or is there just some creepy robber lady going around the cabins and scaring people? I still can't explain the mug, though. I just wish I knew what this was. I work a pretty easygoing office job, and I consistently listen to podcasts while I do my work. That being said, I've always had an interest in the paranormal and the unexplained, so that's typically what I listen to. I was listening to an interview by Astonishing Legends with Terry Lovelace about the things he encountered, and what he experienced from a camping trip in Devil's Den back in the 70s. To sum it up, he touched on what happened to him and a couple of things stood out to me. It reminded me of something that happened to me as a kid that I always chalked up to sleep paralysis. But now, it has me second-guessing myself. I must have been in about the third or fourth grade. At the time, we lived kind of on the edge of a bunch of farmland and woods. Our backyard opened up to our neighbors who owned acres upon acres of land, and to the left of that was just endless farmland and forest. We lived a few miles away from a really popular dairy farm, 
but we were also a mile or two out from the main road that leads into town. I guess the point I'm getting at here is that we were kind of secluded, but not totally isolated. The Midwest is like that at times, I guess. My room at the time was in the basement, and the stairs that led down to it was right in front of our back door. I slept with my bed right in front of my bedroom door as well. It was summer break, and after I finally decided that I was tired, I went to lay down in bed. My memories go in and out at this point, and there are still missing spots in between, because I think as soon as I laid down, I just blacked out. I remember I had just woke up, right after passing out, and I'm not sure how much time had passed between these two points in time. I immediately looked at the foot of my bed, and the door to my room is wide open. There's this blinding light outside my room. I remember seeing this figure right in the doorway to my room. I couldn't make out any distinct features because of the light coming from behind it, so it was backlit. All I got was a silhouette, an outline, and the shape of how it looked. It must have been not that much shorter than me, and I was a kid at the time, maybe around four feet. It had a huge bulbous head and a tiny body. In retrospect, it was shaped like a gray, but I don't know if that's too cliche to say. I just remember this utmost primal sense of fear, and I couldn't move. I've never experienced that level of horror before, and I haven't felt that feeling since. I was laying on my back in my bed, and all I could do was stare at it. I was trying to scream, but nothing could come out. I couldn't get up to run or anything. I was completely paralyzed to that spot. I blacked out again and came to again, and it was closer, right at the end of my bed. At that point, I tried screaming again, but still, nothing would come out. At that point, I blacked out again. I came to that morning, on the opposite side of my room, flopped across this little couch I had. It's hard to explain it, too, because there's nothing in between these points of time. It's just a blank spot. I tried to explain all of this to my mom, but she chalked it up as sleepwalking and a nightmare because I had stayed up too late. Something to that effect. For a while, I was completely horrified to watch any form of alien movie, or even just anything in TV that resembled that shape. I would have a full-blown panic attack and start to hyperventilate. I've gotten past that. It doesn't really get to me anymore. However, to this day, I cannot sleep with my bed in front of my door, or with my door open. I don't even like sleeping near the door. I need to be as far away from it as possible. Even during the day, if I'm doing something in a room, the door has to be closed. Having it open just sends this massive feeling of discomfort and anxiety through me, and I can't do it. I've experienced weird things throughout my life. But this particular instance, I eventually just chalked up to sleep paralysis. But now, I'm not so sure. Can anyone offer any insight? Or at least tell me I'm crazy? Or not? Trying to explain it or even think about it just makes me feel like I'm losing my mind. I work a pretty easygoing office job, and I consistently listen to podcasts while I do my work. That being said, I've always had an interest in the paranormal and the unexplained, so that's typically what I listen to. I was listening to an interview by Astonishing Legends with Terry Lovelace about the things that he encountered, and what he experienced from a camping trip in Devil's Den back in the 70s. To sum it up, he touched on what happened to him, and a couple of things stood out to me. It reminded me of something that happened to me as a kid that I always chalked up to sleep paralysis, but now it has me second-guessing myself. I must have been in about the third or fourth grade. At the time, we lived kind of on the edge of a bunch of farmland and woods. 
our backyard opened up to our neighbors, who owned acres upon acres of land, and to the left of that was just endless farmland and forest. We lived a few miles away from a really popular dairy farm, but we were also a mile or two out from a main road that leads into town. I guess the point I'm getting at is that we were pretty secluded, but not totally isolated. The Midwest is like that at times, I suppose. My room at the time was in the basement, and the stairs that led down to it was right in front of our back door. I slept with my bed right in front of my bedroom door as well. It was summer break, and after I finally decided that I was tired, I went to lay down in my bed. My memory goes in and out at that point, and there are some missing spots in between, because I think as soon as I laid down, I just blacked out. I remember that I woke up right after passing out, and I'm not sure how much time had passed between those two points in time. To me, it felt instantaneous, but I immediately looked at the foot of my bed, and the door to my room was wide open. There was this blinding light outside my room. I remember seeing this figure right in the doorway to my room. I couldn't make out any distinct features because of the light coming from behind it. All I got was a silhouette and the shape of how it looked. It must have been not that much shorter than me as I was a kid at the time, probably about four feet tall, I think. It had a huge bulbous head and a tiny body. In retrospect, it was shaped a little bit like a gray. I just remember this utmost primal sense of fear, and I couldn't move. I've never experienced that level of horror before, and I haven't felt that feeling since. I was laying on my back in my bed, and all I could do was stare at it. I was trying to scream, but nothing came out of my lungs, and I couldn't get up to run or anything because I was completely paralyzed to that spot. I blacked out again, came to, and this time it was closer, right at the end of my bed. At that point, I tried screaming again, but still nothing would come out, and yet again, I blacked out. I came to that morning at the opposite side of my room, flopped across this little couch that I had. It's hard to explain it too because there's just nothing in between these points of time. It's like a blank spot. I tried to explain to my mom what happened, but of course she just chalked it up to sleepwalking and a nightmare because I stayed up too late or something to that effect. For a while after that, I was horrified to watch any form of alien movie or even just anything on TV that resembled what that thing was shaped like. I would have a full-blown panic attack and start to hyperventilate. I've gotten past that, and it doesn't really get to me anymore. However, to this day I can't sleep with my bed in front of my door, or with my door open. I don't even like sleeping near the door. I need to be as far away from it as possible. Even during the day if I'm doing something in a room, I have to close the door. Having it open just sends this massive feeling of discomfort and anxiety over me, and I can't do it. I've experienced weird things throughout my entire life, but after a while, I just chalked it up to sleep paralysis. But now, I'm not so sure anymore. I hope that somebody has answers, or can at least tell me if I'm crazy or not, because even attempting to try to explain it, or even just thinking about it, makes me feel like I'm nuts. I have an attic in my house, and ever since I was young, I hated going up there. It was dark, as there was no light up there, and it was always absolutely freezing. It had a really bad energy, and my anxiety would skyrocket whenever I had to go up there with my dad. It felt like someone had set a timer, and time was running out, if that makes sense. Like I had to get out of there as soon as possible or something really bad would happen. In 2016, my parents decided to convert the attic and make it their bedroom. After this happened, I noticed a lot of unexplainable things going on. The first. One day, I was off school, and I was home alone. I was lying on my bed watching the Jeremy Kyle show, 
with both of my cats on the bed with me. Then I heard what sounded like somebody walking down the stairs from the attic. It's a very distinct sound, and I knew what it was. I paused the video and listened. I didn't hear anything, so I continued watching, now a little on edge. Two minutes later, I heard the footsteps again. My cat's ears perked up, and both of them were staring at my door. Peanut, my cat, started hissing and meowing, and went to the end of my bed to hide. At this point, I was tearing up. I somehow managed to get out of bed and pull my drawers in front of the door. I sat in front of the door and called my dad, sobbing. I explained to him what was happening, and he said to get out of my room and look. Hell no. I begged him to call my neighbors to come in and get me. It was only after I called my dad five times, he kept hanging up on me, that he finally called my neighbors. When my neighbors came in, they have a key, I flew down the stairs sobbing and shaking. My neighbor checked the entire house, but nobody was there. I didn't feel safe staying home for weeks after this. The second. My best friend and I would hang out after school at my house most days, and whenever we did, we would always hear noises from upstairs. One time, in particular, we were in the kitchen making noodles, and we heard banging upstairs. I assumed it was my cat and didn't think anything of it. My friend then shushed me and told me to listen. From upstairs, I could hear the sound of someone opening and closing a chest of drawers and slamming my wardrobe doors. Now, my cats are loud and clever, but how does a cat open a drawer? It's a very distinct sound. So we ended up waiting in my back garden, holding a paint scraper and a knife until my dad came home. The third. This is by far one of the scariest stories. My dad, my sister, and I were all home. My dad called up the stairs to me and said he was going to the shops. Once he left, I went downstairs to grab some food. I asked my sister if she wanted anything to eat, and she said yes. She was in the front room, so I was talking to her from the kitchen. My dad knocked on the door, and I yelled at her to get it. She didn't. I went to get the door, telling her off for being lazy. When I opened the door, in came my dad and my sister. After months of noises, banging, hearing people talking, and walking around when I was home alone, I was sick of it. I felt anxious to be in my own home, and I had other things to worry about. So one day, I decided to try to talk to whatever it was that was in that house. I didn't use a Ouija board or anything like that. I just sat on my stairs and had a chat, I guess. I told them that I respected that they were in this house before, but that they were scaring me and stressing me out. I asked if they would be able to leave, or at the very least, to stop scaring me. After this, I've never had anything happen in my house. No banging, no noises, nothing. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late 20s and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets coldest in Toowoomba, and that night I remember it reaching negative 4 degrees Celsius, or about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block, and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what had happened. He said in a shaky voice, He's here. A ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak out. Dallin's is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still there. 
However, the boarding block and admin block are far, far apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff that he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. We were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers. The wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got really warm, and I mean a quick sudden boost in temperature kind of warm. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think about it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds, although it felt more like five hours. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up and I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running toward the road until both he and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block to find another member of the faculty. We reached the block and we found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told that it was a really common thing to see if you stayed in the admin block too late or if you were walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams. At least once a week, they say. Apparently he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. The faculty member, who was also a teacher, said that he had only seen the Burning Man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he said, All the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, The fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why, he concluded. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her 30s. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, he said. We just wanted to ask if you've ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe in her late 60s or early 70s, came out from the back and said, You two saw the Burning Man, didn't you? Mark replied, Yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a time. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late, and if you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left, and Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. I have quite a few stories I could tell but I decided to start with this one because I think it illustrates a few things about me and my now husband. It was also the first time I really saw a ghost right in front of me rather than in my peripheral vision. I think I may be a bit of an empath judging by the experiences that I've had over the last 50 odd years. My husband, Jay, however, is a skeptic. He says he would love to see a ghost but doesn't expect to. He once took part in a study at a university, one of those classic guess which card I'm holding up experiments. This was in the 70s. Jay got so many wrong that it was statistically significant in the negative direction. He says that proves that there's no such thing. I think it indicates the opposite. I believe he actively blocks his own abilities to the point where he negates the paranormal around him. Being around him is like wearing psychic earplugs it's very soothing. The following occurred in the early 80s when we were at university in northern New South Wales, Australia. Most of the students lived on campus and the university had its own radio station to cater to them. 
A friend of ours, Gail, was a DJ at the time and had a midnight till dawn weekend shift. She invited us up to the station one night to tape some albums from the station's record collection. The radio station was located in a faculty building, about a 20 minute walk from the college where we all lived. Gail had the keys and locked all the doors behind us. The station consisted of two rooms, a large rectangular room housing an office area with two glass-walled studio booths partitioned off on one long side and a storage room housing the library. The entrance door was in the long wall opposite Studio A. The door to the library was in the short wall next to Studio B. Other than the library, the entire area is visible from either of the two studios. Gail commenced her shift using Studio B, while Jay set up in Studio A with some blank cassette tapes and I headed into the library to pick some albums. The record library was fantastic. Four walls of floor-to-ceiling shelving, packed solid with classic rock LPs. I was standing on a chair, choosing some music from the top shelf, when I started feeling that there was someone, or something, behind me. Almost but not quite touching me. I was telling myself not to turn around, that there's nothing there, and so on. But the feeling got so strong that I really wanted to get my back against the wall. I have personal space issues, and the sensation of anything being that close was just too much for me and I had to get out of there. I grabbed a couple of records, took them to Jay, and then I went to talk to Gail in Studio B. From where I was sitting, facing Gail who had her back to the main room, I could see the entire radio station. Jay was in the studio to my right, and the main door was diagonally to my right. The one and only door to the record library was diagonally to my left, all clearly visible through the glass walls of the studio booths. I watched Jay get up, leave Studio A, walk across the office space from right to left behind Gale and enter the record library. As he disappeared into the library, a figure in blue came out of the library door, crossed rapidly from left to right behind Gale, and entered Studio A. I turned my head to look directly into Studio A, but nobody was there. About 15 minutes later, Jay came out of the record library and walked back to Studio A. Immediately, the blue figure shot out of Studio A, crossed behind Gale, and went back into the library. Gale must have seen my eyes following it, because she said, quite excitedly, you saw it, didn't you? I knew if there really was something here, you would know. It turns out that Gail had been feeling like she wasn't alone up there at night, and having heard some of my experiences, she decided to try an experiment. She kept her experiences to herself and then waited to see if I picked up anything. Gee, thanks, Gail. It also turns out, I guess, that while Jay ain't afraid of no ghost, the ghosts seem to be afraid of him. I've always been a big fan of ghost stories and spooky things, but I've never had a story happen directly to me. I've always wanted to or have been excited by experiencing these things. I've just never had an incident that has made me fully commit to saying I've had a ghost experience. However, I usually ask people that I'm comfortable with, do you have any ghost stories? Most of the time I hear some pretty great stories. I have a lot from family, and some crazy ones from my girlfriend, who I think is like the boy from the sixth sense. I'm generally quite a skeptic, but I have fun getting a spooky story nonetheless. Last night when I was at work, I asked my boss if he has any ghost stories. He said that he did. He told me this story whilst cleaning up the bar that he owns. I can only take it as truth, as he admitted to me that he's still somewhat skeptical about it all. But the more he thinks about it, the more he thinks it was a ghost encounter, rather than just a strange occurrence. This is a story that he retold to me while we both admitted to getting goosebumps. My boss Tom was living in the UK and was moving out to Sydney, Australia to work on a big project that required long round-the-clock hours. This included working primarily in front of his laptop. Tom's wife's stepsister owned a house here in Sydney 
that was located in a rather old-timey area near the ports and docks. The stepsister was going away for a while and offered her townhouse for Tom to stay in whilst he was working on this crazy busy project. So he flew out and stayed there by himself. The main bedroom was located on the top floor of the townhouse. At the far end of the room, there was a slant in the roof that only gave a small amount of distance to the floor and the roof. So the designers made a built-in wardrobe to make use of the awkward space. The bed was situated near the doors of these wardrobes, though I don't know how far. One night when Tom was asleep, he was woken up by the sound of deep sobbing. He woke up in a panic and was thinking that it was possibly a fox, as they roughly make the sound of a crying baby at times. The tone was kind of low and made him think that it was a man. He also noticed that the cries were coming from the wardrobe area, which also backed into the wall that was shared with the neighbors. Not thinking much about it, he thought maybe the neighbors were having a rough night and he tried to sleep again. This happened again the next night, and then the night after that. Eventually, Tom was woken up by the sobbing sound and started to get more suspicious of it rather than ignoring it. He sat up in bed and was looking at the wardrobe doors in the dark. He heard the cries for a moment until one of the wardrobe doors popped open right at the moment that he was sitting up paying attention to them. Tom jumped out of bed at this sight and raised his fist in the air, getting ready to punch or defend himself at whoever came out of it. But no one did. Nothing did. He stood there for a moment, then grabbed his bag and hurried downstairs. Tom, sitting in the lounge room downstairs, got his things and prepared for the day and decided to stay at a friend's house for the remaining days he had in Australia because he was getting too spooked to go and sleep there another night. Trying to be rational about it, Tom thought that maybe the things in the wardrobe were pushed up against the door and it just popped open. The more he thinks about it though, the more he thinks about how strange it was. He never spoke to his stepsister about it, out of embarrassment, I guess. Years later, they were at a family function and he was talking to her about the time he stayed there and asked her about her neighbors and who lived next door. The stepsister said to him that the next door house had been unoccupied since she bought the place. Nobody was living there. I have strong reason to believe that Tom was telling the truth in this story, as you just tell when people are trying to get a rise out of you, you know? Or tell the best story in town? This just wasn't the case. Either way, after hearing that story, I just had to share it. I've had two encounters with what I believe to be black-eyed kids. The first time was two years ago or so in a gas station parking lot off of Highway 58 in Tennessee. It was like three or four in the morning. My friend had parked toward the far end of the lot around the side of the building. I was sitting in the passenger side of my friend's car waiting for him to come out of the store from buying his cigarettes. I was fairly relaxed enjoying the radio and then I hear a knock on the window. I looked over and there was a boy. He looked about 12 and he was wearing a gray hoodie with his hood pulled up. I cracked the window and asked him what he wanted and he responded with, can I borrow your phone? I wasn't going to let some strange kid use my phone so I told him that I was sure they would let him use the one inside the store. He kept insisting on it though and it was the weirdest thing because the longer he stood there the more unsettled and scared I started to feel. I had rolled up the window by this point, and he became something less than aggressive but more than insistent. That's when I saw his eyes. His hood slipped back because of his movements, and the only way that I can describe the feeling of looking into those eyes is primal fear. That's about the time he quickly moved to the nearby tree line and a few seconds later my friend got into the car. He said that I was pale as a ghost and asked me what was wrong. At the time, I had no idea what the hell that was all about and I had trouble describing it to him. He looked at me strangely and said that he didn't see the kid at all, and that really got to me. 
So when I got home, I couldn't sleep and stayed up doing some research and found out exactly what I had encountered. The second encounter happened just a few weeks ago. I'm a night owl, so I'm up at pretty ridiculous times of night. I was up at around 3.30 in the morning yet again and watching YouTube videos. Then I hear a knock on the front door. I would normally have just avoided a knock on the door at that time of night, but my roommate's girlfriend had left only about 20 minutes prior, so I assumed it was her having forgotten something. It wouldn't have been the first time. So I went to the door and cracked it a bit to look outside, and there were these three kids. One looked to be around 16 years old, a girl, and the other two were little boys who appeared to be 6 and 10 respectively. They wouldn't look directly at me and held their heads at a downward angle. The porch light cast a pretty heavy shadow over their features, so what they were was again obscured. I hadn't forgotten about my previous encounter, but I didn't know any of the neighborhood kids yet, and I couldn't just assume it was a black-eyed kid when it could have been real desperation standing on my doorstep. I opened the door a bit more, and before I could ask what they were after, the girl said, Can we come in to use your phone? I told her I could fetch it and let her use it, but again she asked to come inside. It was as if I hadn't said anything at all, and her insistence grew just like the last time. She stepped from the front walk to the bottom step of my stoop and looked up at me. I saw those eyes again, slammed the door and went back into the living room, a good distance away from the front door. I heard a few more knocks over the following few minutes, growing more aggressive with each volley until they finally stopped. I didn't dare get close to the door or windows again until sunrise. I've since installed security cameras around the perimeter of the house. If they come back, maybe I'll get some footage. This happened in Costa Mesa, California. I was homeless at the time and under immense stress as a result. I've had a dozen or so very strange things happen in my life, but this one was truly upsetting. I was walking my usual route, which was around the campus of the community college that I attended, even still. I had only recently quit my job and moved out of a house I was renting a room in. Admittedly, I am something of an antisocial, misanthropic, generally depressed person that feels the weight of the world seemingly heavier than my peers. But I'm an A student, and I think a troubled life has lent a heavy hand in these detrimental character traits. I'm being verbose only because I think, or hope, there's a certain genuine nature to someone who can see potential red flags in their own recollections. But I would swear to my creator that the following testimony is 100% accurate. So I was walking and approaching a crosswalk. Down the adjacent sidewalk, I see a woman 30 yards away, walking up to a grocery bag on the sidewalk 10 feet in front of her. She's already carrying two in her hands, one in each. I go to help her as I have nothing to do and she seemed old. As I approached her, this was confirmed. At most, she stood five feet, probably two to three inches shorter. She looked to be about 60 to 70 years old. She was generally unkempt. I asked her if she could use some help. She said with a heavy accent, sure, and indicated her destination was on the other side of the street, where I had planned on crossing anyway. I was handed one of her bags and insisted on taking the other, leaving just the one that she'd been walking up on now at our feet. We start heading to the corner. The bags were heavy enough for me to look inside. It looked to be four mangoes in each bag, but I remember thinking it was easily ten pounds. We get to the crosswalk and she starts hitting the button super fast, like her feet were on fire. At this point, the bags felt as if they had doubled in weight. We get to the signal and I make it no more than halfway through the intersection, and the bags feel every bit of 80 to 100 pounds each. I'm 6'1", and I'm in good shape. I could not believe what was happening. I sincerely didn't think I was going to make it. 
I looked back at her, and she has both hands supporting her bag, taking half strides. She puts on the most disturbing, full tooth smile and said, too heavy? I remember the fear of her face made me turn around more than anything. I made it in one single step to the other side of the street, and I had to drop the bags. I remember the strangest of all was that the plastic handles hadn't been compromised whatsoever. No stretching, nothing. She was click-clacking in half steps, and at this point I was tearing up because I couldn't understand what was happening. She dropped her bag by my two. She looked at me, smiled wide, full teeth again, and said, Too heavy? You stop or keep going. I said, weeping, I'm so sorry. I can't go any farther. Her smile somehow got even bigger, and she said, Okay. I began to sprint back across the street to get away from her. I was ashamed and terrified. I looked back to where she was, and she was now hoisting each bag, one by one, under her chin with both hands, walking at three or four steps, putting it down and then grabbing the next, carrying it three or four steps, over and over. She was walking into a place for the developmentally disabled. It was a community for mentally disabled people in the area. I walked away, weeping as I saw her carry those three bags, now no more than four feet at a time. But I also had no desire to help her anymore. I'm still bewildered and terrified. I don't know what else to add. I know it sounds made up or phony, or like I'm making up for being a terrible person. But I'm telling you, those bags went from holding just a few mangoes each to feeling like they were holding so much more. I don't know how that happened. And it's almost like she knew somehow. I don't know what happened that day, but it did. And if anybody knows how to explain it, please let me know. I went on a little hiking trip with my dad to Shasta, California, a small town in Northern California near the Oregon border. Shasta is home to a potentially active volcano, named, of course, Mount Shasta. There are many trails on Mount Shasta, so my father and I were excited to do some hiking. We drove up the side of the mountain to the parking lot in which one of the trails begins. I believe it was called the Old Ski Bowl Trail. The landscape was a very barren incline filled with rocks, boulders, dirt, and very few trees. About an hour into the trail, we came across a very odd assembly of these large boulders. They were arranged in a circle. We thought it was strange, but we continued on. If you look up pictures of the trail, you'll see much smaller rocks arranged in patterns and circles. My father and I only encountered three people. At least, that's what they appeared to be at first. The first two were a father and son. We met them on a steep incline that went along the wall of a cliff that would then switch back as it reached the top of the cliff. We stopped and said hello, talked about the trail, and then went along our separate ways. Here's where it gets weird. Dad and I kept walking up the incline for just about two minutes. I turned around and I saw the father and son so far down the trail. It should have taken them at least 20 minutes to get down to where they were but somehow they were there in only two minutes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea how that could have happened. There was no one else on the trail at that point, and I could see the color of their clothing from that distance, so I knew it was them. I pointed it out to my dad. We thought it was weird, but we didn't dwell on it, and we kept going. Here's where it gets so much weirder. As we reached the top of the cliff, there was another strange rock arrangement that was off to the side of the trail. This time, there were far more rocks than before, and they were now arranged in rows, almost like gravestones. We continued on the trail and reached another sort of incline, with a switchback to reach the top of yet another cliff. We reached a point where we would need climbing gear to continue, so we decided to head back. When we turned around, 
I saw a man standing among the rocks, staring at us. He was wearing a button-up shirt, cargo shorts, and a wide-brimmed straw hat. He was at a distance where I should have been able to make out his facial features, but it was almost as if he had none, like his face was just flesh and skin. I pointed him out to my dad, and then the man quickly ducked down behind a boulder and was peering out at us over the top of it. It seemed almost playful, like a child trying to play hide-and-seek. For a few moments, I was out of it, and I have no recollection of what was going on. According to my dad, I just started walking toward this man in the hat. My dad was calling out to me, Joshua, Josh, what are you doing? Where are you going? And then I came to. I was standing right at the edge of a cliff. It was a huge drop, enough to kill me or seriously injure me. My dad grabbed me and pulled me back to the trail. He told me to stay put, and my dad went down to the boulders to search for the man. But he wasn't there. There was nowhere for him to go except up or down the trail. It didn't make any sense. He just disappeared. I have no idea what was going on on that trail, and I have no explanation for it. I have told this story many times to family and friends, and no one else has an explanation either. I've done research and I've found similar stories about encounters with a man with no facial features wearing a hat. I've also read that the Native American tribes from the area viewed Mount Shasta as a holy site. They believe that it could act as a portal to another dimension, and that it's guarded by spirits who would potentially harm anybody who tried to go up to the volcano. If anybody has any similar experiences, or any insight at all, I would love to hear. I live near Mount Hope Cemetery. It's the very same one that Stephen King mentions in his books, and the one that he cameos in in Pet Cemetery. Day and night, Mount Hope Cemetery is always unsettling. Every time I pass by it, I always feel like I'm being watched. Most of the time, it's an easy feeling to brush off, but there are three instances where I've been shook to the core. First, I was in the fourth grade. My whole class went on a field trip to the cemetery. From the very beginning when it was brought up, I expressed my lack of interest in going, but I was the only one not showing enthusiasm, so I knew then it was going to happen. I dreaded it, hoping that my teacher would decide to cancel the trip. I wasn't allowed to skip school as a kid, so I never even asked. I went to the cemetery with my class, and they were all having a wonderful time. I was immersed in vibes that were making me sick to my stomach. We were told to make rubbings on paper with crayon of at least three gravestones that caught our eye. I didn't want to, but I did anyway. While I'm rubbing these gravestones, I felt like I was stepping on the toes of someone and that I was bothering someone. I managed to rub two, the third I picked. My crayon was still in my left hand. I grabbed a piece of paper from the pile near me but when I knelt down to begin rubbing it, I had an overwhelming feeling of anger wash over me. I stopped dead. For a second, I couldn't move. That gravestone didn't want to be rubbed. I tried to talk myself into reason. It's a 117-year-old rotted corpse. It can't possibly do anything. But to no avail. I could have forced myself to rub this one but I thought that that wasn't best. I didn't rub a third one. I just couldn't get myself to do it. It freaked me out. I said it out loud to nobody in particular. There's something wrong with this grave. It doesn't... I stopped talking. I wasn't really comfortable talking about the experience to anyone around me. I knew that they wouldn't have believed me anyway. I know what I felt and it wasn't peaceful. If I had rubbed that grave, someone, or something, would have attached itself to me, and it would have been nearly impossible to shake off. It was in the summer of 2012, 
I biked home from work. I worked at Wendy's. The cemetery was on my right. I looked because I saw somebody. I thought it was just a dumb teenager doing something stupid, but it wasn't. I saw two shadows watching me, one looming over a grave. It had long, creepy fingers and a thick, dark, malevolent energy that seemed so bent on anger and misery that it must have been an entity of pure evil. The other was a man, a shadow, standing right next to it. It was standing next to a thick tree. His top hat brim remained straight, even though as close as he was to that tree, the tree would have bent the brim. He must have been seven feet tall. The looming one lunged toward me. I yelled an expletive completely sure that I was about to get possessed. The akimbo one flinched, and then they were both gone. I was still myself and relieved, heart pounding, but I was okay. The third. I was biking home again through Mount Hope Avenue. I almost got through the cemetery without seeing anything. Then, suddenly, two lights caught my attention. They were moving crazy fast, one was chasing the other. They crossed the road in front of me. The one lagging behind suddenly pounced. They let go. They both darted past the road and onto the other side. The moment they began getting smaller, they were gone. Of course, there are times when I can't avoid going past Mount Hope Cemetery. I have sensed other spirits and the like. I just completely downright refuse to acknowledge them. There's definitely something sinister about the cemetery, and part of me feels like there might be something that wants to latch on to me there. My sister and I slept in the same bedroom. She's two years younger than me. Our beds were pretty much next to each other. Next to my sister's bed was a tall wardrobe. Not a spooky one, just a white box from Ikea. It was attached to the wall and filled with our old toys. One night, I woke up to my sister sitting on her bed, mumbling quietly. She's done this before, but this time she was facing the wardrobe, so I only saw her back. I sat up quickly, remembering the previous time this had happened. I felt super uneasy. I didn't feel like somebody was in the room. I couldn't sense anything around us. I just felt scared. What I hadn't realized immediately was that my sister wasn't just facing the wardrobe, but the door was actually open. Not just a little bit, like I took something during the day and didn't notice that I left it open a crack but it had been clearly opened during the night. We never go to that wardrobe since there's just a ton of old toys in there, nothing that we actually need. Instead of asking who she was talking to or what she was talking about, I decided to just listen. Or maybe I was too afraid to ask. I honestly can't remember. At first I only heard mumbling and I couldn't make out anything. But then I heard her clearly ask, what did you want to tell me, while looking into the wardrobe? And when I shifted a little bit in my bed to look, that's when I got this overwhelming feeling of someone being in the room with us. I called my sister's name and I noticed her stiffening from hearing my voice, but she didn't turn around to face me, before quietly mumbling, I have to go, and closing the door of the closet. After that, she seemed way sleepier, way less aware of her surroundings, like she was still asleep. But the way that she just spoke a little bit earlier and closed the door was like a completely coherent person. She seemed to be fully awake, not like she was still asleep. She fell asleep right after I told her to lay her head on the pillow and get some sleep. And once again, like the last time, she couldn't remember any of this the next morning. After the previous time, the feeling of the unsafe and dark presence disappeared. But after this time, it stayed. Every day, in every room, 
It felt like someone was looking at you or sitting in the shadows. It sounds spooky, but it felt even spookier. I feel like usually home is your safe place, but during that time, it felt like everything but safe and cozy. My mom experienced super vivid bad dreams. Never before had she believed us, or in any sort of presences or ghosts, or had she ever been spooked out by those things. I struggled with severe insomnia, but my little sister? She slept like a baby. Around a month after the wardrobe incident, I woke up again to the same setting, and this time I just started crying immediately from how freaked out I was. My sister was once again sitting on her bed, facing the wardrobe with her back turned towards me. This time the door was closed, but she was tapping the same door with her fingernail, not once or twice, but continuously, while mumbling quietly. This time I immediately told her to stop and get back to bed. She put her hand down and kept mumbling, but kept facing the wardrobe. I called her name calmly again for a couple of times before she finally turned to me with her eyes closed and said, I can't do it. I asked what she couldn't do, but then she just laid down and fell asleep. After this night, the bad energy or presence I had felt disappeared, and slowly my mom's nightmares and my insomnia left too. I still don't know what the heck was going on, but honestly, I'm just glad it stopped. I moved out about a year after that, and now my sister has her own room, so there's no telling if stuff like this keeps happening or not. But there are still times when I visit my mom's place and feel the same feeling of unsafe, especially during the nights. So about three years ago, I went camping with my now ex-girlfriend, as she had always expressed an interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest, and it's my go-to trail and camp spot. It's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs, etc. My family has been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends that introduced me to it have been going for about ten years or so. We went for a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to the campsite, but they were just stargazing and they ended up leaving. Around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like somebody was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended. It got very high-pitched and sounded as it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. And that's when the laugh noise moved up higher and started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped. Then it started up again at about 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in my hand, and I turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see coyotes or something like that around the campsite. I didn't see anything or hear any movements. This went on until about 6 a.m. and then it stopped. That's when we were finally able to get some rest. After we woke up, we checked around the campsite, but we didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I went to start my vehicle and it was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I am always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure that everything was closed properly and unplugged the night before. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from AAA somehow. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but at the end we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite and also had a cabin in the same forest about 25 miles away. When I told him what happened, he got freaked out. He told me about two incidents, which he's had one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. 
While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the tree looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight up at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, there they were, looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that leads into the woods. They stated that the height of the eyes that were looking at them meant that whatever it was had to be at least seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes had disappeared. But once they were done shooting, the eyes reappeared, this time closer. At that point, they were both freaked out and went back to the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all feel very scared. We especially felt fear at the time that the events were happening. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thinks it might have been a Wendigo. I don't really know what it could have been, but I have never felt that scared before or since. This happened when I was about seven years old to my uncle. He's no longer with us and I wanted to share his story. Growing up, I lived in northern Michigan on 5,000 acres of farm and ranch land that backed up into state land. Nothing but miles of forest and pasture could be seen. Needless to say, it made us pretty tough and it takes a lot to spook us. We're all avid hunters, fishermen, and outdoorsmen. Being the only girl, I was raised as a tomboy, and I'm just the same. My uncle went off to join the military, becoming a senior NCO in a prominent Special Forces division of the U.S. Navy. He was 6'4", built like a wrestler, obviously skilled in survival tactics, and nothing rattled him. He was home on leave and went out hunting as it was deer season. I remember him coming in the house, shaking and crying, saying that he saw something in the woods. My uncle never cried. He was tough as nails and would tear someone to shreds before he let them make him cry. My grandmother tried to get him to make sense, but he kept saying that he saw Bigfoot mixed with the wolf. My granny immediately got my grandfather and he rounded up the rest of the guys. The hunting squad went out, which was my dad a few male cousins, my uncle who was still terrified but didn't want to be labeled a chicken, and a couple of other guys. They all got their shotguns and ammunition and saddled the horses to go clear the woods. Apparently, they were aware of the dog man, but I was blissfully young and ignorant. They told me to stay inside and said that for absolutely no reason was I to step outside of our house until they returned. I had never heard my dad or grandfather so serious so I hid in my room. Sunset comes, and they still aren't back. I'm really worried at this point, because they've never stayed in the woods after dark. Shortly, I heard the sound of the horses running to the barn and their voices. I was so relieved. They looked troubled when they came into the house, but didn't say anything, probably not to spook me. At dinner, my dad laid down the law that I was no longer allowed to play outside or go to the barns alone. I had to have my grandfather with me at all times. Of course, I was pretty upset by this and felt that my independence was being taken away, but I obeyed. The next morning, my dad and grandfather taught me how to shoot. That's when I knew it was serious. I overheard the adults talking the next night. Apparently, there were tracks where my uncle had his sighting bigger than any wolf could make, but definitely not dog tracks. As I said before, we're all avid outdoorsmen, and we can definitely identify tracks. My family has identified the tracks of just about every animal in that area, and some outside of it, but these couldn't be identified. About eight feet up in a tree were claw marks. No Michigan bear could make those. We also found claw marks of about the same height on multiple trees throughout the property. 
There were cattle, mutilated, and not in any way that a coyote or bear would, and it lasted the whole winter. We lost about 30 to 40 cattle that winter, all of them mutilated, all with the same wolf dog tracks in the snow. I really feel like this experience changed my uncle. Who knows, he did multiple tours in the Middle East for Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom before unfortunately finally taking his own life. After that experience, though, he was never the same. He never touched alcohol before this. But after this, I never saw him without a bottle of Jack in his hand, and his eyes were always haunted. He changed his personality. He never even went out in the woods again. He quit hunting, and he eventually just quit coming home to visit on leave. He didn't even come home for my dad's funeral two years later. It was heartbreaking to see him deteriorate the way he did. I truly believe that he saw something out there, and while he might have gotten away that day, it ultimately killed him. After she had surgery for kidney stones, my grandma became more sensitive about things. Exactly after the surgery, while she was still in the hospital, we both met in our dreams. She's seen me in her dream, and I've seen her in my similar dream on the same night. There's a lot to say about that too, but that's a story for another day. About a half a year later, she kept mentioning the little ugly people coming out of this particular flower pot in her apartment. According to her, they would come out during the nighttime or very early in the morning, just rising from the flower pot, walking a little bit around the room, and then going back into the flower pot and decreasing in size until the flower pot would swallow them. Bear in mind, this happened around 10 years ago. She told the entire family and even though my mom and I are believers of the paranormal, we thought it might be age that was speaking in this case. Maybe she was hallucinating. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. But no, she kept insisting and insisting that she sees them every night. Then she kept giving us details. We suggested she might be dreaming, and she would respond that she would get up and turn on the lights every time. They seemed to wake her up almost every night. On some nights, she would go to my grandpa in his bedroom. They were sleeping separately because they enjoyed the solitude and comfort. And she would wake him up and say, they're back. By the time my grandpa would come into her room, nothing was there. One night, she called my mom to say that they've woken her up again. She gave us a lot of details about these creatures, that they were small but quite ugly that's why she named them the Little Ugly People. They were maximum one meter in height. They were weirdly dressed. Later on, she described them better, and I came to the conclusion that the fashion style would be around the 1800s. They also had hats. They were both male and female, and it was only one of them coming out per night, never more of them, even though I do refer to them as plural. It seemed that they were struggling a bit to get out of the flower pot, and, by implication, the flower, which was just a normal apartment plant. She tried to communicate with them every time, but with no success. They never hurt her, and they weren't doing anything to the objects in the room. They walked around the room, sometimes going to a different flower pot, and disappearing there. There were times when she lost it and started screaming at them, and telling them to leave her alone. One time she said she woke up and looked around and there was a tiny creature staring at her. Most of the time they were staring at her. Also, some of them had beards. We've searched for a very long time for any kind of reasonable explanation. Then we started to believe her and we searched for a paranormal one. I posted on a paranormal forum many, many years ago and the answer I received was that they were gnomes visiting my grandma, and that she should not interact with them, as they might get aggressive and dangerous. 
They suggested putting rocks in a circle around the flower pot, and we did. I don't recall any other suggestion. This went on for more than a year. After about six months of quiet after we put the stones out, she started to forget things. Soon after, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which she bravely battled for another two to three years. She's no longer with us, and I miss her, but sometimes I still meet her in my dreams. We started to think that maybe, since she ultimately was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she was hallucinating. But that doesn't explain why after we put the stones out, it stopped happening, unless it was power of suggestion. Whether it was something medical or paranormal, it was still a really bizarre thing, and I'll never forget it. I am an Arabian military officer, and what I witnessed defies belief. I have not yet found a good explanation for what happened to me, so I'd love any input if you know. I'm an ordinary man who didn't believe in ghosts and paranormal stuff. I never thought that one day I would be on a date with something that made me reconsider my whole belief system. First off, I'm a military officer in a big Middle Eastern country, and due to the sensitivity of my job, I can't go into specific details about the story I'm going to tell you. We had our orders to camp in a specific spot within the desert and wait to execute our designated mission. The first couple of days went by and everything seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary. Then we began to notice a strange man walking on nearby hills, wearing what looked to be women's clothing. His walk was steady, as if he was looking for something specific. The first time we saw him, we thought he might be one of the locals or nomads and didn't think much of it, but I sent two soldiers anyway to bring him down to me for questioning and warned him to keep a distance, as it's considered a military area now. But he managed to disappear and vanish every single time before anybody could get near to him. It became a habit seeing this weird person, and we sort of got used to watching him every day. Finally, when our mission was about to finish up and we were getting ready to pack up our gear and leave, something different happened. It was on Wednesday, February 10th of 2010. I was in my tent trying to get some sleep when I heard the sound of gunshots coming from outside. I quickly pulled my gun and ran out of the tent to find one of the soldiers shouting, We got him! We finally got him, sir! I asked him nervously who it was, but deep down, I knew who he was talking about. He said, it's that strange man that we see every day. We saw him coming down from the hills, running toward us, as if he was floating above the ground. So we shot him twice in the chest. I don't know why, but I had this overwhelming feeling that something really bad was about to happen. Reluctantly, I asked him to show me the body. Once we got there, I swear, we both heard the sound of a man laughing loudly and giggling. When I looked at the dead body, it was a man in his mid-thirties, wearing white women's lingerie. He had a strange necklace that had an odd symbol around his neck. His face looked directly at me, smiling, as if somehow he knew what I felt and what I was thinking. Honestly, I was freaking out myself, but I didn't want to show it. I had this gut feeling that we made a huge mistake killing this being, whatever it was. At that point, I was almost convinced it wasn't human. It was downtime. The sun was about to rise, so I told the men to carry the body out and bury it. When they finished, one of the soldiers wrote a Quranic verse on a stone, which says, O oh satisfied soul, return to your Lord well pleased, well pleasing. Join my devotees and enter my heaven. And we placed it on top of the tomb. When we all gathered around the grave to recite some Quran in order to ease his soul, we didn't believe our eyes when we saw the hard stone above the grave crack in half. Then we all heard an angry roaring coming from inside the grave, while the dirt around it was violently shaking. This was it for me. 
I couldn't take it any longer, so I ordered the soldiers to grab their stuff in a hurry and get the hell out of there. After I got back, I went to this old wise man that I knew, like a shaman, to tell him about this freaky incident and find some answers. He asked me to describe the shape of the necklace the man was wearing, but refused to tell me anything further. All he said was, you should be thankful to God that you got out of there safely. Till this day, I still have no idea what this man was, and whether it was a djinn or a demon. All I know for sure is that he was not human. Okay, so backstory here. My mom is batshit crazy, like way out there, beyond rescue. She divorced my father when I was a kid and married a nut job that fit her brand of crazy. His family lives in a cult commune on the border of Utah and Nevada, kind of near Garrison, Utah. This commune follows something called the Church of Aaron and Levi. They're kind of like a mixture of Christian, Jewish, Catholic, and Mormon. They have this dairy that they sell milk from, which is how they fund their commune. No disrespect, I just think it's nuts. Now this place is friggin' weird. I used to have to go out there as a kid and stay with my stepdad's nutso family in their commune. The one good thing about this place though is that it's in the middle of the desert. As in, back then you wouldn't find civilization in any direction you wanted to go. Delta, Utah was the nearest place, and it was pitifully small back then. It took an hour to get there anyway. Now, as a kid, I was lucky enough to have dirt bikes thanks to my biological dad. So, every so often when I got dragged out to this commune, I would be allowed to bring my dirt bike. I'd get five gallons of gas, strap it on my back fender, and head off into the desert for the day. This was very dangerous for a kid my age, and I probably should have died more than once. But alas, here I am. Anyway, that's irrelevant. One of these times, I miscalculated the amount of daylight I had left, and I ended up with about a two hour ride back in the pitch dark. Now, if you've ever been out in the middle of the desert at night, and nowhere near civilization, you know that it's really, really dark. And depending on how bright the moon is, sometimes you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Unfortunately, this happened to be one of those nights. The particular dirt bike I was riding at the time was an old Honda Enduro with a decent headlight on it, so I could still see a bit. I managed to find an old dirt road leading to mines in the mountains from like the 40s, which led to the main road and then back to the commune. It was so dark that I had to stick my foot out and feel the edges of the road to make sure I stayed on it. I was cruising along, starting to shiver, and out of nowhere, this white light illuminated the whole valley. I could see for miles, but it wasn't like daylight. It was pure white light. Naturally, my head started spinning with ideas, trying to make heads from tails, trying to figure out where this light was coming from. It seemed like it was directly above me. I stopped my bike after almost crashing for the hundredth time to see where the light was coming from, and I looked up. I didn't see anything. There was no craft in the sky, there was no fireball, no meteor, no nothing. Just black sky and stars. But yet, I could see the whole valley around me. By the time I was able to gather myself, I kick-started the motorcycle and began riding again while somewhat enjoying this ridiculously illuminated landscape. And just as quickly as this light came, it disappeared. Like a light switch had been turned off. It was nothing but black. At this point, my eyes were used to the light, so the darkness slapped me across the face even harder. The light only lasted for about 15 to 18 minutes total, but it felt like a really long time, so the dark was that much more unsettling. I managed to make it back and get to sleep, but that experience has always stuck with me. My first guess is that there was some kind of military aircraft being tested in the desert, 
and they came across some random kid in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night on a shitty dirt bike, and were probably just as surprised to see me as I was to see the light. I didn't hear a thing, and I didn't see a thing, but it was the brightest light I've ever seen in my life, and to this day, I have no idea what happened. These are my encounters with the creatures known as dogmen while living in Kentucky. They still haunt me to this day, so I thought I would share them. Story number one. I was eight years old, living in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. It was the summer of 2012, and it was a hot one. One summer night, I woke at about 11.30 to 12 o'clock. I was sweating like hell, so I walked over to the window to crack it open. That's when I saw something in the tree line by our stock pond. We owned no animals other than a small terrier, but the previous owners had been commercial farmers. I watched for about five minutes before it emerged, and when it did, I was horrified. It was a wolf-like creature, about six to seven feet tall, and partially covered in dark gray hair that shone in the light of the full moon. It walked out on two legs, and then very quickly dropped on all fours and ran the hundred or so yards to the stock pond in mere seconds. It drank for a while, and then stood up on two legs again, and I got a really good look at it. The thing was horrid looking. The fur was all patchy, very skinny, and it looked like it was covered in some kind of injuries. Years later, when I saw the third Harry Potter movie for the first time, I saw the werewolf, and that's almost exactly what it looked like. It then took off across the old cornfield and into the woods on the other side. I'd heard stories of the creature, but I never really believed them. Not until that night. About a week later, I was around town with my folks, and I heard that there had been an attack at a nearby farm. Three hogs and a horse had been eaten and ripped to shreds. That was my first, but not my last, encounter with a dog man. I caught glimpses of the things constantly, ever since that first sighting, but I never got another good look at one of them until fall of 2015, a month before we moved to Maine. It was dusk, and I was outside with some of my friends, playing with our Nerf guns, as young boys do. And, man, those were the good days. Anyway, after a while we got bored and started a fire. We told dirty jokes and laughed for a while. But then we started hearing noises in the woods, and the laughter died down. We all retreated to the woodshed and armed ourselves with axes, pitchforks, and the like before returning to the fire. About ten minutes later, something rustled in the woods about twenty yards behind us, but no one dared to look to see what the hell it was. Finally, my friend Jeremy slowly turned around to look, and then screamed. He let out a scream so loud it could have brought down the barn roof. That's when we all turned around and saw one of them. Except this one was much taller. I'd say eight and a half to nine feet. It was pure muscle and gray hair. It was on all fours sniffing around the barn. But when Jeremy screamed, the thing looked at us, stood up on two legs, and snarled. That's when my dad came out of the house with a shotgun and screamed, what in God's name is going on? We all just pointed and screamed, and then he looked at it and yelled, Go on, get! and shot at it twice. It ran into the woods, yelping. I'm pretty sure it was hit. And we all went inside and locked the doors. My dad sat in his chair with that shotgun the whole night, and I swore that I heard scratching along the side of the house until daylight. Turns out when we went outside the next morning, there were claw marks all over our house on the outside. After that, everything was quiet until we moved. Unfortunately, I have never seen anything like that since.
I'll start by saying that I did not personally witness or experience this, but the story comes from a close family friend whom I consider reputable and honest. Personally, I'm rather skeptical when it comes to most paranormal activity, but I believe this story because of the man who told it. So as a little bit of background, my father was a police officer for 25 years through the 80s and 90s. His best friends were mostly officers growing up. I always met and was around cops. Some of my father's cop friends were annoying and rude, and some were really squared away nice guys. One in particular was my favorite. I won't use his real name, so I'll just refer to him as Bob. Bob was one of my father's closest friends and beat partner for a long time. He was an older African-American man from New Orleans. He was polite, had great mannerisms, and carried himself confidently. My father used to say he was the most honest cop he ever worked with and had solid integrity and bravery. One night, he and my father worked an off-duty job at a local event, some sort of carnival or fair. I can't remember exactly, but there was a clown there. My father told me the entire night Bob was acting strangely, acting uncomfortable, quiet, and shy. When my father asked him what was wrong, Bob just said, I hate clowns. I always have. My father started poking fun at him for being scared of the clown, and he said that Bob just stared at him with this look that he'd never seen him have before, like he was genuinely afraid. So my father asks why, and this is Bob's story. Bob grew up in New Orleans. When he was a child, his mom took him to stay at his aunt's house for a few weeks. Bob said that he didn't care much for his aunt. She wasn't mean to him, but he always got a strange vibe when he was around her, as though she carried an evil aura with her. His family used to joke that his aunt was involved in voodoo and black magic, but they mostly just said these things in jest. His time at his aunt's was largely uneventful, with the exception of a strange rule she had. He was not allowed into the kitchen. Bob didn't understand why, but he followed it. On some nights, Bob claimed to hear his aunt talking to people in the kitchen at odd hours. In the mornings, he would question his aunt if she had friends over, and she would say that she didn't. His aunt had a thing for dolls. She had them all around the house. He hated them. He said whenever he passed by the cabinets displaying them, he always felt like he was being watched. But she had one doll that she always carried around and protected like it was some kind of treasure. You guessed it, a clown doll. He said his aunt loved this thing, always took it around the house, caring for it like it was a child. He didn't understand why. He said it was ugly and horrible looking and was the most frightening one that she owned. One night, he said that he smelled his aunt baking something sweet and conversing with someone. He got excited and ran into the kitchen without thinking about his aunt's single rule. When he ran in, he saw on the counter the clown doll moving its mouth and speaking to his aunt in a man's voice. The clown turned its head and looked at Bob. His aunt turned around frantically and scolded him out of the kitchen. He said that as his aunt rushed him out of the kitchen, he heard the clown doll laughing. After that night, he never left his room and barely slept. His aunt claimed that he was imagining seeing the clown talk. He never went back after the incident. My father, who's a big time paranormal skeptic, believes Bob. He said that he had never seen Bob's eyes or body language display so much discomfort and fear as he did when he was telling that story and when he looked at the clowns. He looked my dad square in the eyes and said, I know what I saw and I know how it sounds, but I'm telling you that it happened. That doll was alive.
Ever since I was five years old, I've had an extreme fear of dolls. I am terrified of them. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who are, but when I reached the age of about 16, my mother finally told me where my fear may have come from. It's from a personal experience. To this day, I can never fully answer whether I believe in the paranormal or not. But my personal experience with a doll given to me by an aunt who practiced black magic haunts me until this day. When my mom told me this tale, I had minor flashbacks of the feeling that I had with this specific doll. From the first day I was born, I never slept properly. Never did, never have, and probably never will. I didn't cry or anything when I was awake early. I would just quietly play with my hands and wait for my mom to come get me. I did this from when I was an infant until I was a toddler. Around age five, we had an aunt from my biological father's side visit us. Now, keep in mind that I have nothing to do with my biological father, and this aunt may have wished my mother harm. Fijians from that generation are typically very superstitious, and many of them believe in black magic. The things I began to do made us believe that there was something very wrong with this porcelain doll that she had given me as a gift. My mom began to notice that I would spend a lot of time with the doll. My younger brother, who would have been around one to two years old at that time, spent a lot of time with my mom. I was a very jealous child when he was first born, so at first, she wasn't too surprised that I spent my time away from them. One morning, she came to my bedroom and was surprised that I wasn't there. Like I said before, no matter what time I was awake at, I never got up without her. We had a basement that my brother and I were strictly forbidden from opening and going into because the stairs were spaced quite far apart and being small, we could easily have fallen through or down onto the concrete. She had a lock put up on the high door just in case. Besides that, the basement was freaky as hell and I never even wanted to go in there alone, ever. This particular morning, along with noticing that I was not in my usual place waiting for her, she noticed that this freakish doll wasn't there either. Before she called out my name, she heard me sniveling downstairs. As she climbed the stairs down toward me, she saw that doll sitting on the couch. She heard my crying get louder. As she got closer, she saw that I was trying to open the basement door lock while crying. Sharissa, what the heck are you doing? Didn't I tell you to never go down there without me? I started screaming and crying and ran to bury my face in her dress with relief. Such relief that she was there to stop me. I kept telling her, Mommy, the doll made me, the doll made me, through my tears. I have no idea what this doll's name is anymore, but I apparently was saying the name of the doll instead of the doll. My mom, who is not a believer, was thoroughly creeped out because she said that my tears and hysterical crying were not that of a child trying to find an excuse for getting caught doing something bad, but actual relief of being saved. She packed me up and we were off to my grandma's house, without the doll. We got rid of that doll stat. I know that this is a hard story to believe for anybody. I probably would have just played it off as me being a child and trying to blame the doll for getting caught. But I know that I never dared to get up without my mom because I was scared to get up by myself and I liked the attention of her coming to get me out of bed every morning. I also have very creepy memories of some things about that doll that I'm still too scared to even think about let alone write down.
I've had a couple of experience with doppelgangers. The first was when I was about 19. I suddenly woke up from my sleep and immediately had a frightened feeling. I had a wardrobe in front of my bed at the time with a full-length mirror on it. In the mirror, I can see my bed and the windows behind it. In the window behind me, I saw what appeared to be my mom, but she had a seriously twisted look on her face, an expression that was creepy and that I've never seen on her before. She was staring at me in the mirror, and for a couple of minutes, all I could do was stare back at her in fear. I thought perhaps I had sleep paralysis, as I have experienced that my whole life, but it turned out that I could move, so I sat up fast and looked out the window, but nobody was there. I looked back into the mirror, and she was gone. It would have been impossible for her to go anywhere, as my room was on the second story, and the window looked out to my balcony, which is only accessible through my room. It's also unlikely that she was able to get onto the balcony through the house. She would have had to come through my room and open the incredibly hard to open, very noisy, banging balcony door that was behind my bed, right by my head. I got out of bed and went to check on my mom, who was fast asleep in her bed and clearly had not been through my bedroom or jumped off the second story balcony to go through the front door, up the stairs and back to her room in a matter of a minute or so. I turned all the lights on, and I stayed up for the rest of the night. The second time was a few weeks ago. At first, all was fine. I was in bed, woken up in the night, and rolled over to hug my boyfriend. Immediately, I felt like it wasn't him. But I didn't want to believe that, and I just wanted to feel comforted. He was making weird noises, and I told him to stop being weird. He then spoke in a voice that was not his. I looked up at him and he had the same twisted look on his face that my mother's had had. It was even creepier to see it up close. I said, you're not my boyfriend, but I was too scared to move. He tried to convince me for a bit and I kept asking, who are you? I got out of bed, terrified, and I just kept demanding, who are you, you're not him. He then got up and started throwing and dragging me around the room while I kept crying, you're not my boyfriend. He managed to drag me out to the hallway, with many moments of pulling and fighting away and him throwing and dragging me. He was a lot stronger than my boyfriend was, and he was laughing, seemed disturbingly amused by all of this. I suddenly jolt and I am in bed sitting up with my heart racing. I thought, thank God, hopefully it was just a dream. But it felt so real and I was conscious and in control of my actions the entire time, unlike even the most lucid of dreams. Then I thought sleep paralysis, but then how could I move and make decisions? After searching for a phenomenon like this, I've seen a little bit about astral projection. Could that be the case? I thought I would check to see if any of the details in the house were different to my potential dream, but they were the same including the bumped frame on the wall that was crooked that I had not noticed the day before. I really hope it was just an incredibly vivid dream, but having had experienced sleep paralysis all my life, I'm pretty good at deciphering what is an awake hallucination or sleep paralysis and what's a dream, and it definitely felt like the former. Has anyone experienced something similar or encountered doppelgangers like this before? Does anybody know what this weird dreaming but feeling absolutely awake and lucid thing is? Any feedback is appreciated. It still haunts me. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. 
floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh twenty inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky, and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too, and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit, and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out, leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended, about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. 
One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond, because it was perfectly round, like a crater. The water had obviously receded, and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door. A full car door, half buried under pine duff riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the South, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. Bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum-quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then, the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately, because my uncle was a chiropractor, and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush, and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other, as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened. Did they figure it out? And over time, their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually, I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day, and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, 
which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road where the reception was a little better and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck with its lights off appeared out of the woods and passed us very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time, it had to be at least ten minutes that went by, but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again, and then backs up along the narrow, dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit. But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park and they don't own any black unmarked SUVs, nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were or what they wanted. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground, the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. 
Every day I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock about the size of a baseball rolling across the trail. Me, being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turn to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down, hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one, as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek. I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, So, you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot? He started snidely laughing. I said, Listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but... It's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night, and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. The park ranger said that I was very lucky because while he wasn't Bigfoot, He was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility, and to this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridgetop. I definitely feel bad for the guy. That was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods. So, back in Halloween of the early 2000s, my friends and I were trick-or-treating, as we were only in our freshman or sophomore years of high school. We had taken a walk to a wealthier neighborhood in the hopes that they would have better candy than ours did, and we were supposed to cut through a slightly wooded area into a friend's backyard. 
My friend Will was leading us through, and he didn't really know the shortcut back. So, we ended up in a very small clearing, just barely still visible from the street. We could still see the street though, so we didn't end up getting lost. The point, though, is the house that we found. It was slightly old and definitely abandoned with all of the overgrowth covering it, making it hard to see from the street. We wanted to check it out, as it was Halloween and we figured we should get a little spooked. We did get spooked too when we peeked through the back screen door and saw a little bit of movement in the pitch black house. But we were already slightly creeped out so we decided to walk back and take the right shortcut. As we went back, we saw a little bit of movement behind us, and all of us booked it home, being as excitable as we already were. This all happened five months before the actual point of the story occurred. By this time, we had explored the house sealing off the first floor with a door, shower curtain, and weights, as there was some kind of substance in the air that would always make us feel unwell. We made a setup out of the upper floor of the house that we could relax in, we were using it as a spot to hang out, having filled it with battery lamps and chairs, as well as sleeping bags for when we would have get-togethers away from our parents for a long time. But as cozy as we made it, the things that we found in the house creeped us out endlessly. The ones I remember the most were the two closets, one with a hook and a rope on the ceiling, and possibly dried blood on the ground. The other closet was filled with plastic on the walls and what we think was also blood. New cleaning supplies were still under the kitchen sink even though the faucet was removed as well as the oven. There was a functional cotton gin sitting in the empty garage and a grime covered knife sitting in the sink. We ignored most of these things and simply sealed off more rooms that creeped us out. But when we found that knife in the sink, I was worried somebody could use it to attack one of us if they somehow ended up squatting in the hideout we made. So I got the genius idea of going to the absolutely filthy brown and black fluid leaking out of the walls bathroom that no one would ever think to go in and throw the knife in the toilet, which was filled with the same grime and sludge. But when I went in, I failed to notice the door for some reason ever so gently closing behind me. And as I was looking around the bathroom for a place to hide the knife, the room got thick and cold except for a slight warmth on my left shoulder. And I was paralyzed. That moment started to feel like hours. Then, ever so quietly and weakly and tiredly, I heard a noise in my left ear. Like something that's a cross between a whimper and a dry-throated croak. It seemed filled with more sadness and panic and pleading than I've ever felt in my entire life. I quickly ran out, tossing the knife behind me, and slammed the door shut as hard as I could, feeling a force pull back against me. Then I ran out to my friends who were just outside by the door. We sealed that room up too, and we only went back to clean out our things. We called the police anonymously and the house was searched and a few months later, it was demolished. I'd like to say that although the police searched and apparently found nothing, I concretely believe that a woman, or maybe some poor girl, died in that house. I hope she isn't angry with me. This happened a long time ago. I was 12 and in my grandparents' village. We had a cow and an ox. Usually the son of the bull, usually just one, took all the cattle to graze and at night he would take them back. Cows know where to go when they're going home. My grandpa had a male ox and since my father was an adult and he wasn't there, I took the responsibility. Basically, my job was to go around the village with the ox trailing after me, calling the people to open their doors. Our ox would grunt to call the herd, and all the females came out. From then on, I had to take them to a clearing up in the mountains, 
and then later take them to the river. It was easy. The animals already knew where they were going. They were calm, and our bull was a gentle giant. All I did was ride him, and I had a thin rope on his horns. If any of the females wandered off, all I had to do was call, or, on rare occasions, poke her with a dull stick in the right direction. My grandpa said that if I saw a wolf, a boar, or a fox, I should stay on the ox. Not many animals would dare go near an ox herd. There is a dark part of the forest where it's very quiet and even the bravest hunters won't go there. It's very slippery and dangerous. They said that even the deer and boar dare not go there. I was forbidden to go there, and honestly, I never wanted to. It was an early morning and everything seemed fine. I was on the ox going up the mountain, and I was glad that he let me because it was hard to trek up. I saw that one of the females was wandering off. I followed her and left our ox and the dogs to guide the herd. She went into the forest. I ran to her and got on tying the rope onto her horns. I tried steering her away, but she continued. She went into the dark part and stopped. I didn't want to get off in case she ran back and left me there. I heard a crunch and turned around. A very old man was walking toward us. He looked frail with dirty clothes and a long beard. I was scared, so I laid on the ox, clinging to her, not wanting to fall off if she ran. Oxen aren't like bulls. They don't jump and kick when they're scared. They either attack with their horns and trample, or run. I was ready to hold on no matter what she chose to do. Our oxen don't take kindly to strangers. Before I took them out, I had to go to every house and have the ox owner introduce me to the animal. That way, they saw that their owner trusts me, and their herd leader, our ox, trusts me too. I knew that she would either attack or bolt, but she just stood there. The stranger came to us and petted her on the head, whispering something I didn't understand. He looked up at me, and his eyes were completely white. Then he turned around and left, just disappearing into the trees. Suddenly the female grunted as if she had just woken up or come out of a trance. Our male does that noise every morning, and then she bolted the way we'd come from. We found the herd, I quickly got on our ox and yelled water. He knew that command and went down toward the river. There were houses there, and it was closer than home. I barged in to one of the houses and tried to explain. The couple there stayed with me and sent their daughter to call my grandpa. I couldn't sleep for days, remembering those whited out eyes. My grandparents didn't let me out of the house or garden, and I wasn't allowed near trees. Later, I learned that they were protecting me from a lesnick a forest spirit which can take the form of a man, an owl, or a wolf. It hates when people go into his part of the woods, and can kidnap you. I later learned that the ox which took me there had fallen ill and died. It sometimes stays in the trees as an owl, looking for the offender. For years, when I went to my grandparents, they wouldn't let me be alone. Not just outside, but inside too. All I know is that I'm never going into those woods again. The following happened in a nearby woods when I was in 7th or 8th grade, which was the late 1980s and to this day I have no idea what it was or why it happened. I'll preface this story by saying that although I was fairly young when it took place, I had literally grown up in the middle of a forest and spent just about every free moment out among the trees. I never had any fear of nature and by the time I was in middle school, I was already a pretty competent hunter and tracker and could identify just about any animal by its tracks, 
sounds, or scat. I had had close-up encounters with groundhogs, raccoons, deer, and even coyotes and great horned owls, which is why whatever my friend and I encountered that day confuses me. I was at my friend Roger's house, also a burgeoning outdoorsman. One afternoon we decided to walk to a small woods, maybe a quarter mile from his house, just to check it out. I think it must have been late fall or early spring, because the trees were barren, the ground was muddy, and it was chilly outside, around 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We weren't looking for anything, it was just something to do. So we walk over, enter the woods, and just start walking around, talking and looking at the trees and the occasional bits of trash that people had left behind. Eventually, we wander apart from each other by maybe 30 yards. There's not much overgrowth, so we can still see each other. It was about this time that I started getting that being watched feeling. A second later, out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of a white flash four or five feet off the ground. It seemed to come from or dodge behind one of the trees. It wasn't light, exactly, but more like a very white object of undefinable shape and size. I looked around for a minute but never did see anything else, and figured that it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. So I went back to exploring, but then it happened again, and I still couldn't see anything when I looked around more directly. After a few seconds, the flash or white object seemed to appear and disappear among the trees in different directions. One time it would be off to my left, then just a few seconds later it would be to my right or just behind me. I was a little freaked out but mostly just really curious as to what was happening. This went on for maybe three to four minutes. Right about then I noticed that Roger was standing next to me, looking pale and shaken up. I think we should go back now, he said. I have to admit I was a little disappointed, but I had never seen him look or act quite that way before. Usually the kid wasn't afraid of anything and was a little bit of a troublemaker. So we trudged out of the woods and back onto the little gravel road that ran to it and headed back toward his house. Roger didn't say a word the whole way back. When we finally got back to his house, we went to get a snack, and as we were standing in the kitchen, I briefly asked him, So, out there, did you see some kind of white thing? Because I kept... Almost immediately he cut me off. Yeah, and I don't want to ever talk about it. Again, it was a response that was very out of character for my normally tough-talking friend. A couple of years later, he, I, and another friend would be on a late-night walk, get mistaken for burglars, and have a gun pulled on us. Even after being threatened with a firearm, he was never this quiet or freaked out. I dropped it, and I hadn't asked him about it since. I still see Roger occasionally, but we've never talked about that day again. And in decades of rambling around every sort of woods that I can find, I've never encountered anything like that again. Nothing has ever felt or looked like that. No bird, bear, mountain lion, or anything else. Not even people. I have no idea what we saw that day, but I hope somebody does, because it haunts me still today. Here's a little bit of background to start. I'm from Texas and my boyfriend is from Maine. We both live in Texas now in a decently sized city outside of Dallas. But during the summer, we attempt to escape the heat and visit his family in Maine for a few weeks. I had my fair share of experiences growing up in a haunted house, so I was raised as a believer. 
Weird things seem to happen frequently, but I don't like to automatically attribute it to a ghost or whatever. I'd like to think that I'm a fairly logical person, and I like to try to debunk weird things. That being said, my boyfriend is pretty skeptical and doesn't spook easily, so that makes this story even more interesting. At around 11 p.m. one night, he and I were sitting on his dad's front porch, just chit-chatting. The porch is raised and looks down over a backyard that runs to the tree line at the edge of a thick woods. We were just hanging out, sober, I might add, when we heard what sounded like an adolescent boy singing scales. La 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 la. Over and over. It was just background noise, and honestly, we were so used to living in an apartment in the city back home that we didn't think anything of it. In fact, we were annoyed. My boyfriend actually said, do you think he knows we're here? That could be awkward. I laughed. And then I realized what we were listening to. We were hearing what sounded like a boy, in the woods, late at night, walking back and forth in the dark woods, singing scales repeatedly. My boyfriend was still bent on the idea that he should give the guy some warning that he had an audience. So kind of mockingly, he sings back, la 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 la. The boy sang the same thing back from the trees. It sounded like whoever it was was instantly standing right at the tree line beside us. It was loud and sounded as if whoever, or whatever it was, had instantly covered a huge amount of space to go from somewhere in the woods to just a few feet away from us. We both instantly had the fight or flight response and, without even thinking or discussing it, we both jumped up as if we were going to run into the house. Something about it felt weird and we had flipped a switch from harmless, awkward fun to terrified. There's a house back there, right? I asked my boyfriend. There has to be, he said back. We were spooked and went into the house anyway. We both couldn't stop thinking about it, and suddenly the details began to sink in about just how weird this actually was. First, if that was an actual person, we would have heard them stomping around in the woods. It sounded as if they were pacing back and forth over an area of about 20 feet, and the woods were thick. You couldn't walk through them without making a ruckus and cracking leaves and twigs. Second, there were no lights through the trees. If that was actually a 12 or 13 year old boy, unless he has a night vision, he would have needed a flashlight to accompany him, especially if he was taking such careful steps as to not make a sound. If there was a flashlight, we would have seen it through the dark. Third, how did he instantly cover that much space to get right beside us at the tree line? I know that voices can be carried on the wind and sound distorted, but there was no wind that night. It also sounded enough like a real person, not a floating voice on the wind, that we both just automatically assumed that there was actually a boy out there. Lastly, we asked his dad where in the woods his neighbor's house was. He just looked at us and said, What neighbors? I don't have neighbors. There's not a house back there for miles. People in Maine don't tend to have close neighbors, but the next day we went back and checked anywhere. As far as we could go, there was no sign of people anywhere. My dad told me this story recently, and I felt the need to share it. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who what you see is what you get. 
and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons he barely hunts or scouts alone anymore, unless he can't help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell with him still clueless on where he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was pitch dark, his little flashlight not giving much light. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he may have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing if it was he needed to get the hell out, but not be hasty about it as to spook it if it was a bear. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him in a distance, but as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up and gaining on him. My dad starts walking faster, and, as I'm sure you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now, maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared shitless, he turns around and shines his flashlight to see nothing, except for huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead, and everything around it that had been living was too. He started freaking out, and straight out sprinted, not caring which way he was going. He just wanted to get as far away from that thing as possible. The footsteps behind him were now following suit, sprinting after him. He only glanced back one more time, seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass and leaves wherever they had landed. By now, he's not sure how long or far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that someone can help him if he comes upon a house or store. He breaks out of the woods, and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on her porch, the lights on outside. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading the Bible at this time. As embarrassing as it was for him to admit, he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks. She stood up and looked behind him to see the hoof prints and hear the sounds for herself. She held her hands out to him and he grasped onto them tightly as she pulled him into her. And then she said loudly, you can't have him. He said the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder. So when he looks up, all he can see is where the hoof prints and dead grass and leaves lay. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that it was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that my grandmother saved his life that night. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind, the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town shut it down, and just lay down on the snow looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence, 
Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be introspective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field and so on. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold but the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was that there must be an animal nearby, in which case I need to get out of there fast. You don't really want to be messing around with wild animals, especially in the Arctic. But the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding. And again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me, not laterally anyway. It was coming from above me. So naturally I look up, determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I notice something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking that they were just oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved to be false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. Then it stops. The lights are gone, the clicking isn't heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold, and rather petrified, so I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry, but soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior. Probably not that big of a deal, right? I pull up to my house. The lights are all dark. Strange. It wasn't that late when I left. I open the outer door as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear, and enter the inner door. The house is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anybody noticing. Proves to be easy, and I'm soon under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day, and all of a sudden, everything makes sense. The engine was hard to start. I was really stiff. It was rather chilly. Nobody up when I was gone what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 p.m. when I left, and now it was creeping up on 6 a.m. I stood, staring at clicking lights, for almost seven hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late snow machine rides anymore. I'm telling this story on behalf of my girlfriend. We'll call her Amy. She's 21 years old now and was around seven at the time of the encounter. This story has been pieced together from what she can remember, what her brother remembers, and what her mother and father can recall from the incident. She lived in a relatively recently constructed house in a very quiet area in West Yorkshire, England. Think Emmerdale, located beside a graveyard. Cliché, I know. Being that it was in a rural area and a new house, it was very quiet at night, 
and any words spoken in any room could be heard at the other side of the house. When her dad was redoing their garden, he unearthed a multitude of very old, dusty objects, including old bottles and pieces of stone slab that really couldn't be anything other than pieces of old graves, leading the family to believe that their house was built on top of an older part of the graveyard that had sunken into the ground after many years unattended to. One night, just after the school holidays had ended, her brother, Alex, remembers being sat in the lounge doing his homework. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw his little sister Amy holding a book out to him, apparently trying to be helpful. He told her that she should be in bed, given that it was past her bedtime, and focused back on his books. Their mother, from upstairs, no doubt having heard what he had said to Amy, shouted down, Amy's already in bed. Alex, then from his books, looked up completely and realized that the girl standing in front of him was a complete stranger, with red hair instead of Amy's brown hair. Given the extremely late hour and what he describes as an intense and immediate feeling of unease, he screamed, which caused the stranger to dart toward the stairs, away from him. Alex followed immediately, and upon reaching the stairs he bumped into his mother, who had come running down at the sound of his yelling. In a state of panic, he began shouting at his mother about a girl who he had just seen run past her on the stairs. His mother saw nothing, led him back to the lounge, and tried to calm him down. Later that night, having calmed himself down and gone upstairs to his bed, he was heading toward the toilet at the end of the upstairs hall when he saw the red-headed stranger again in Amy's room, sat on the end of her bed, just watching her sleep. Overwhelmed with the same feeling of unease, he rigidly returned to his room and upon waking in the morning, convinced himself that it had only been a dream brought on by the strange events from earlier that night. Months later, the family was sitting in the lounge, discussing what Alex had seen that night, a subject that up until this point had been relatively avoided. Alex and their father both randomly blurted out at the same time that they had a feeling the girl's name was Alice. Neither of them could shake that extreme coincidence, and decided that they would search the large graveyard for any headstones with the name Alice. I'd love to be able to tell you that they found a single child-sized grave with the name Alice spookily engraved into the headstone, that they discovered that she had red hair and knew the exact circumstance of her death, but the reality is that there were numerous graves with the name Alice in that graveyard. In fact, so many that they can't even remember the exact number. Whether or not the name Alice was stuck in their subconscious having explored the graveyard at a previous date is up for discussion, but we still believe it was too much of a coincidence for them to be filled with that same feeling of intense confidence in her name at the exact moment. The family, having long moved away from that house, maintains that there were multiple strange occurrences in the household since Alex's encounter during his homework that night, and that out of the corner of his eye, Alex would still see a red-haired girl in the corners of Amy's room. This happened to me about 10 years ago, but it still sticks with me to this day. I was around 15 years old, and my mom and dad decided that we would take a trip to my aunt and uncle's new house that they had just bought in Gridley, Illinois, and stay for a few days. We lived in central Indiana, so it was about a three and a half hour drive to get there. The house was an old farmhouse, probably built in the early to mid 1900s, and sat very isolated basically in the middle of a cornfield. I have a very large family, and a few more of my mom's siblings traveled to the house as well, so they were going to have a big party. My uncle, who owns the house, has a son who's about a year or two younger than me. We'll call him Steve. So my cousin Steve and I had been hanging out all night, 
playing video games, spending time with our families, and so on. Everyone was up fairly late, and as people started to go to bed, the party was dying down, and Steve and I decided to go to his room and crash for the night. Steve has a pretty small bedroom. I would say it's about 10 feet by 10 feet, but he did have bunk beds, so there was plenty of room for both of us to sleep in there. He normally slept on the bottom bunk, so I climbed up top to lay down for the night. As I did basically every night, I would pull out my phone and check MySpace or Facebook, whatever I was using at the time. I can't remember if MySpace was dead by then. So after laying there for about five minutes, Steve gets out of bed and said that he needed to use the restroom. The head of the bed is right next to the door. So I look down and I watch him leave the room and shut the door behind him. His room was basically pitch black dark, but there was some light from the hallway, so I clearly saw him leave. At this point, I'm laying on the top bunk in his room by myself in basically pitch darkness besides a light from my cell phone. He was gone for maybe a minute, when all of a sudden, the bunk bed starts slamming into the wall behind me, like there was somebody at the foot of the bed rocking the bunk back into the wall. As it's slamming into the wall, my first thought was that maybe one of Steve's older brothers was playing a prank or something. So I said, cut it out, that's not funny. The bed continues to slam into the wall. It did probably 10 times in total, about once every second or two. I waited for it to stop and I hopped down off the bunk to turn on the lights, expecting someone to be standing at the end of the bed laughing at me. I turned the lights on, but nothing. Nobody was in the room, just me. Like I said, it's a very small room and I made sure to check everywhere. Under the bed, in the closet, I was the only person there. At this point, I was completely terrified, and I was trying to rationalize what had just happened. I decided maybe the bed is just rickety, and somehow I was rocking it. I got to the foot of the bed and I tried to recreate what had happened. Not happening. This bed is one of those all-metal bunk beds bolted together, and it's not going anywhere. The only way to get that bed to move the way that it did would be to slide the entire bed back into the wall, slide it back, and repeat this motion. This thing was on carpet too, so it wasn't moving. I tried with all of my strength to mimic what I had felt, and I couldn't do it. At this point, I'm in total panic mode. I run out of the room, down the hallway to the bathroom, and I ask my cousin what the hell he was doing. He told me that he was going to the bathroom, I asked him if he was just in the room messing with me, and he asked me what I was talking about. I explained what happened, and once he was out of the bathroom, we went back to his room and talked about it. He said that he and his family have almost all had experiences of some kind in that house, paranormal in nature, since they moved in. Safe to say that night, I did not sleep in his room. I went and slept on the floor next to the bed where my parents were sleeping. This is the only time in my life that I have ever experienced anything paranormal, and that'll do for me. This is a 100% true story that I will keep with me until the day I die. A number of years ago, when I was still living at home with my dad and stepmom, we had a large, beautiful, purebred German Shepherd. I had had a rough childhood, and this dog was my best friend. He was the smartest and most loyal dog I had, and still have, ever met. He passed away a few years after this incident, and I still think of him, and miss him often. Anyway. Our house had a long hallway off the living room. Down the hallway was a bedroom on the left, followed by a bathroom and my bedroom that was at the very end. I had lived there since I was two and I was used to being alone. I usually preferred it, honestly. So I was very comfortable in my surroundings. This particular evening, my dad and stepmom had gone out 
and I was sitting on my bed watching TV with my dog laying next to me. The front and back door were closed and locked, as well as the windows as I live in the north and at night, especially in the fall, winter, and spring months, it gets quite cold. My bedroom door was closed and latched. My TV and light were on and one lamp in the living room was on, but no other electronics were on in the house. My dog and I were just sitting there on my bed. Movement caught my eye. My dog lifted his head to look at my door just as I turned my head. The two of us watched the door handle turning, as if someone were on the other side, opening the door. As the handle turned and the door opened, my dog sat up to attention, looking very tense. The door very slowly creaked open all of the way. I was quite stunned as I knew that I was home alone, and although I just saw the door handle turn and the door open, I could see nothing there that could have opened my door. Suddenly, my dog jumped up and off my bed. He took off running down the hallway faster than I could even react. As I got up to go investigate, I could hear the rumble of his growl coming from the living room. It got louder and louder as I got farther down the hallway. When I looked into the living room, he was standing underneath the ceiling fan, directly in the middle of the room, looking straight up. Remember, the fan wasn't on. The only things on in the entire house were a single lamp in the living room and my bedroom light and television. The black hair along his entire back was raised. He stood frozen, snout pointed up, growling fiercely. I stared at him for a second as I had never seen him behave like this. He was so fixated on whatever it was that I didn't think he realized I had followed him down the hall. Quietly I called out to him. I called his name and asked him what was wrong. As soon as the words left my mouth, he spun around and stepped to me. He began making a soft whimpering noise, mushing his head against me, pushing me back down the hallway. As I moved backward, he pushed harder. I turned away from the living room, and we were both running back down the hall by the time we got to my bedroom door. I turned my body to face the door as we crossed into my bedroom, and my door slammed shut and locked behind us on its own. I watched from three feet away as the lock turned. I have heard and read that when a door is slammed hard enough, the mechanism inside may get jostled enough to lock itself. But what had slammed the door shut in the first place? My dog stood by the door, not making a sound. He stared at the door handle, not moving a muscle. I called my dad, trying not to sound panicked, as I knew they wouldn't believe my story, and tried to casually ask when he would be home. He told me that they were on their way and about 20 minutes out. My dog stood there, not moving, keeping his body between me and the door until my parents came home that night. I don't know what it is that had the power to unlatch and open my door, slam it shut, and lock it. I don't know what it was that my dog saw that night, but I could feel that while he was pushing me away from the living room, he was trying to protect me. He knew it wasn't safe. He was pushing me away from whatever he saw or felt. He stood guard for me until my parents came home. He was my best friend and my protector. Rest in peace, buddy. Thank you for keeping me safe. My partner and I have recently moved into a new house, which I love and am happy to be in. But some curious things have happened that I can't really find an explanation for. Last night, however, was the most bizarre. The original house was built in 1942, and we highly suspect that half of it was added on later because it doesn't quite fit the rest of the house. My partner, a sincere skeptic, noticed this from the architecture, but I can sort of feel it in the energy of the house. The newer front area, a combined living room, kitchen, and bathroom, feels very calm and welcoming, 
while the older back of the house, a master bedroom, bathroom, office, and sunroom, is darker and sometimes uncomfortable for me to be in from time to time. The air feels heavier to me and seems to put off a lot of static that I can feel under my feet. Though, to be fair, I do spend less time in that part of the house, so this sense of unrest could be due to that, I suppose. The bathroom in the master bedroom is the oddest place for me. There is a small door in the ceiling that leads to the attic, and for whatever reason, it particularly draws my attention. Also, the door to the bathroom has a tendency to swing open when it's ajar, but I'm aware that that could be a draft. We also tend to hear a lot of noises at night. But again, this could easily be dismissed by a draft and the fact that it is a fairly old house. The first strange thing to happen. I was laying in bed, half asleep, and suddenly a glass water bottle fell over and rolled across the floor. My partner and I were both startled, and he immediately yelled out, Who is it? Who's there? In his sleep, then laid back down and has no recollection of this. It was about four feet from the bed, so there's no way I could have knocked it over. And, like I said, I wasn't completely asleep yet when this happened. I remember laying completely still, on my stomach, with my knees facing the direction away from the bottle, there were several things between me and it that would have been knocked down as well had it been me. Last night I was having an excruciating time falling asleep, with just a general sense of unrest despite how exhausted I was. Finally, when I did fall asleep, I had a nightmare that there was a woman walking through our house. She was inhumanly old, with a severe hunched back and a shuffling walk. The most unsettling part, though, was that she had her arm outstretched in front of her, and in the center of her palm she was holding her own eye. She stopped directly in front of the door to our bedroom and peered sideways at me, both with her head and the eye in her hand. I woke with a violent start and knocked the remote off the bed, which was pretty loud. My partner began to sleep talk, and we had a conversation. He said, is she here? I said, is who here? He said, the woman. What woman? What are you talking about? The woman from your dream, he said. I said, how did you know I was dreaming about a woman? It's okay, go, go back to sleep. He said, is the woman here? At which point I began to rub his back and just tried to get him to stop talking. He said several other things in his sleep and was very restless, tossing and turning and moaning all night. As soon as I woke up this morning, I asked him about it, and again he has no recollection of talking in his sleep or of anything happening. Although he says he doesn't feel rested at all, and can tell that he must have slept poorly. I know some people are going to say he was just screwing with me, but he's not that kind of person. Anyway, he's a devout skeptic, who respects my belief in attached energies and the paranormal, but doesn't share those beliefs himself. He would have no reason to pull a trick on me like that. More importantly, how would he have even known that I was dreaming about a woman? I personally don't believe in ghosts. Nonetheless, I am very interested in paranormal stuff, mostly because I enjoy a good horror story. Everyone experiences something creepy now and then, and even though I am a large skeptic, I too have found myself in some situations that creeped me out a bit. In the end, I always found a satisfying explanation for what I encountered and then I probably just forget that it ever happened. Or I remember it and just find it funny because of how silly I was for being so scared. Most people experience their creepy stories at night, 
which is no big surprise because it's just natural to be more aware at that time. We tend to feel more vulnerable in the darkness. Our eyesight is no more reliable, which leads to the fact that sudden sounds or noises can't be easily explained. This leads me to some very strange encounters that I experienced in the middle of the day on a crowded street. It was May. The weather was very pleasant and warm. The local city marathon took place that day in which some of my mother's co-workers took part, so she took me with her to cheer them on. While the running track led around the inner districts of our city, we took shortcuts to get to the checkpoints in time. After a while, we crossed a bridge, which ended at an intersection. You could say there was quite a lot of traffic that day, and many other pedestrians and spectators of the marathon were crowding the street. As we waited for the pedestrian lights to turn green, I looked at the ground and my mother was holding my hand. I was around 11 years old. The sidewalk was very crowded, so there was hardly any space for everyone. I looked at my shoes, and then on the shoes of the other pedestrians. All of them were pointing to the street that they were just about to cross in a minute. When I looked up again, a young woman was standing right in front of me, looking at me and moving her lips, whispering strangely with tears in her eyes. She was standing so close that I would have touched her if I had just reached out my index finger toward her. I looked around, but nobody showed any kind of reaction, not even my mother, who was always very cautious and sometimes even snapped at me when I just looked at weird people on the street. It felt like no one else but me saw this strange woman. I'll never forget what she looked like. She was very skinny. Her skin was pale, dry, and kind of dirty, just like her clothes. She wore a beige worn-out cardigan, a long skirt, and damaged leather shoes. Her hair was light brown and short, chin length, and like the rest of her skin, her lips were very dry. Yellowish chunks of skin stood off of them as they moved while she was whispering straight into my face. I couldn't hear what she was saying. She was probably only moving her lips but I really can't tell what exactly was going on there. I couldn't look away, and I was so in shock that I couldn't even say anything. When the pedestrian lights finally turned green, everyone moved forward. The woman stepped aside, and I guess she just stayed there on the sidewalk. I didn't see her crossing the street with us, and when I turned around on the other side, she was gone. How did she even get there? In the middle of the bridge was a lane of traffic. You couldn't access the bridge from any other side, because on both the left and the right was quite a large riverbank with bushes. It puzzles me to this day. This woman looked as if she'd been falling into muddy water and had let her clothes just dry onto her body. A few years later, I tried to find out if this bridge with the river underneath it was a common spot to jump off, or if something tragic had happened there, but in my country it's nearly impossible to get public access to that kind of information. As a skeptic, I don't believe she was a ghost. It's more likely for her to be a deranged person roaming the streets, but I don't understand why everybody acted as if nobody was there. Even my mother looked over to me during the incident and didn't seem to mind at all. I wish I knew who this woman was and if she needed help. And if she did, why would she talk to a little kid instead of an adult? I have two stories to share. Let me first start by explaining why most corner rooms in hotels are always the most haunted places. In my culture, we believe that corner rooms must be avoided in any hotels due to the fact that it's the least populated or visited area by humans, since they don't walk toward the end of the hallway often. Thus, 
spirits can have that space to themselves without much disturbance. Starting with my personal story. Back in 2017, my mother and I visited Korea and went to Jeju Island. We stayed in a pretty new hotel. It was spacious and big, and the price was rather cheap for a four-star hotel. Upon our dismay, we were allocated the corner room. Thinking it was a new hotel, my mom and I brushed off any unpleasant feelings and checked into our room. It was pretty late at night, around 11 p.m. when we checked in. In Chinese beliefs, when checking into a hotel room, you always knock on the door and politely tell any spirits inside that you're merely staying for a few days and won't disturb them. Flush the toilet immediately upon entering, and also place your shoes in a somewhat messy manner. We did everything. However, upon entering the room, we felt really drained and uncomfortable. We received two keys in a card format, one for electrical usage in the room and one for the door key. My mother put the card on the table and we started unpacking. To our horror, after unpacking and wanting to go to the convenience store to buy some snacks, the keys had disappeared and were not on the table anymore. My mother immediately started blaming me for misplacing them and we spent a good 20 to 30 minutes arguing while flipping the whole room over for the key. When we were about to give up, the keys sort of magically appeared at the same spot on the table again. There's no way we would have missed it, it was right smack dab in the middle of the table in front of us. Also we realized that the beverages in the fridge were all half drank. Not sure if the hotel staff just didn't change it or if it was something supernatural but it's worth mentioning. The feeling in the room was still particularly ominous, so we decided to check out. I called the receptionist hotline with the phone provided by them in the room, but all I heard was static. In the end, we packed everything and went down to the reception to request a room change. The next room we checked into didn't have any heavy or ominous feelings, and we had a good and comfortable stay overall. The next story is my friend's, we'll call her Giselle. Giselle went to Perth on a school trip and was paired with Lindy to be her hotel roommate. Unfortunately, they got the corner room. Giselle was strongly against this as her dad is a medium and had always advised her to stay away from corner rooms or if the room made her feel uncomfortable regardless of where it was. She immediately felt cold and uncomfortable in the room upon entering it, but she tried her best to shrug it off. Giselle and Lindy turned on the TV. The only thing that came up on every single channel was horror shows. They started to feel a little bit creeped out, because no matter how many channels they changed, it was always horror shows or previews. What broke the camel's back was when they checked on their water supply. They all received a full water bottle from their school since they had to compete in a choir competition. It was essential to finish the water at designated timings. The water bottle only had half the water left. Neither of them had touched or drank any of the water, but it was only half filled for both bottles. They were 100% sure and adamant that they received a full bottle of water. They were unable to change rooms despite telling their teacher in charge what happened. So they packed up all their stuff and crashed in other people's rooms. The women in my family know things that we couldn't possibly know. Sometimes we know things that are literally impossible for us to know. The main three are me, my daughter, and my mom. It's not like a psychic thing. We can't control it. In my experience, it's like taking a test you studied really hard for, so you're very confident in your answer. My mom's thing is safety. She always knows when somebody is in danger or is going to get hurt, or is going to need help. She has called me as something was happening before to ask me if the exact thing that was happening had happened. 
My thing is people. I'm never wrong about people. And my daughter's thing is pregnancy. She can always tell when someone is pregnant. Here's an example from my mom. My parents got married at 19. I was born a year later. When they were 22, my mom was pregnant with my baby brother and my dad wanted to go to a concert. My mom said she didn't want him to because he was going to get hurt. My dad told her he'd be fine. She was probably just anxious because of me and being pregnant with my brother. And anyway, he wouldn't be out too late. Now at that age, my dad had a hot temper and a spotless driving record. She should have been worried about him getting in a fight or something, but no. She said she just knew that he was going to get in a wreck, but he insisted that it would be fine. She finally agreed, but she made him promise to wear his seatbelt. He did. On his way home from the concert, there was a long, empty, boring stretch of road. He was alone. He fell asleep going 70 miles per hour and wrecked into a tree. If he hadn't been wearing his seatbelt, which he often didn't, he would have died. My mom basically saved his life that night. My example, my sister became friends with this girl and before I even met her, I didn't like her. My sister said that she was fun and happy and bubbly. She got mad at me because I said, look, she's going to overwhelm you really fast. And then when you tell her that you need a break, she's going to threaten to harm herself. She told me that that was ridiculous, that I was assuming things. I said, I'm not assuming, I'm telling you. I know that's what's going to happen. She said, I was just jealous. Sure enough, two months later, my sister calls me absolutely losing it. She said, dude, how did you know that? How did you know that she would do that? She told this girl she needed some space and the girl said, well, I'm just gonna off myself then. No one wants to be around me. She didn't and my sister no longer hangs out with her, but my sister was really freaked out that I knew that. Finally, my daughter's example. I had a friend come over. She announced her pregnancy. My daughter was three years old. We congratulated her and hung out and talked for a while. When they left, my daughter said, Mama, why did Miss Taylor say that she's pregnant? Thinking she was wondering what pregnant meant, I said, Oh, because she has a baby in her belly. My daughter looked me dead in the eyes and said, No, Mama, she doesn't. The baby died. A few days later, my friend called me to tell me she had a miscarriage. Another friend came over to hang out. My daughter was four at this time. And my daughter said, what are you gonna name your baby? This woman had been trying to have a baby for about three years at this point with no luck. She said, I'm not having a baby. My daughter said, oh yes you are. There's a baby in your belly. She found out she was pregnant two weeks later. I don't know if this is some kind of glitch, like we have interdimensional knowledge or what, but it doesn't feel like a psychic thing. Like I said before, it's almost like we've studied for this or we know because we've been there. It's really hard to explain, but either way, it's definitely kind of strange and trippy. What do you think? I'm fairly skeptical of the paranormal, so I don't really know what to believe. But the only stories that are even a little similar to what I experienced all seem to be paranormal. To give some backstory, my street and neighborhood are pretty quiet, especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up into the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler, knowing that I'm most likely the only person on my street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences, like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighbors. But for the past week, 
I have been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2 a.m. last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in my bed, on my phone with earbuds in, something I do almost every night, when I began to hear whistling coming from out my window. I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistle, trying to come up with an explanation. Normally I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late, and to be honest I get more excited that something's happening and that I'm there to witness it. But this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up, to look out my window, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit in my stomach growing larger. It went on for almost an hour, and for the entire hour I waited for the whistling to start a tune or a song I could look up, but it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, then take a break for about 30 seconds, and then return to its one minute whistle, until about 20 minutes in, when the whistles got shorter and closer together only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even stranger was that whatever it was, was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped when it retreated back down the other side of the street. As I heard it leave, I almost immediately felt the pit in my stomach subside, and while I was still confused, I decided I should just go to sleep before I scared myself even more. So the next day, I asked my parents and even some of my friends that live close by if they had ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was some kind of animal, which made me feel a lot better. But I wanted a definite answer of what I heard. I stayed up for hours that night, researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was. So I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again, and that this time I would look out my window to see it. But with my luck, I've never heard the whistling again. Except lots of weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing somebody, or something, walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways and sometimes even yards, very late at night. But whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. Then about two nights ago, I swear I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. And then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house. And whatever was holding that flashlight was running out of the woods. Then again last night, I swear I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car, just looking around. I thought I was done researching because I couldn't find anything about animals, but now I've begun researching any stories even similar to mine, hoping that either I'm not alone, or even better, somebody has the answer to the strange occurrences going on. Because I would like to start sleeping at more normal times again, and not have to be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist or something else, coming to get me in my sleep. I've always had a belief in the unknown and spirits but I had never really experienced anything from the unknown, other than the typical deja vu we all experience from time to time. And then, high school happened. I have two stories about my own personal experiences. They are true events, even if people are skeptical. I know what I saw. I know what I felt. Believe whatever you want to believe, or believe what will help you sleep at night. But either way, these are true. Before I get into the stories, it's probably worth pointing out that I used to use Ouija boards with one of my friends. Stupid, I know. So when I was in high school, we lived in this neighborhood with an old textile mill in it. 
I always had a creepy vibe about the mill. I've never looked up if anything happened there, because I've always been, and still am, afraid of what I might find. My bus stop used to be in front of the mill, and I had to start walking to school, because I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched by someone, or something, at the mill. Now, two things happened after I started walking to school. One, I started seeing a little girl out of the corner of my eye, about four or five in the mornings as I was getting ready for school. I was the only one awake at the time, so maybe she just felt comfortable appearing then. I never felt threatened by her, and I don't know her name, but she looked like she was maybe from the 20s. I actually stopped seeing her after a while, which made me kind of sad, even though her presence also sent a shiver down my spine. The second thing that happened was my brother and his friend decided to go in the mill, where, according to them, they found markings where a body was and dried blood. I don't know how true that is because I refuse to go into that place, but I still can't ever shake the feeling that something is watching me even to this day. In fact, I think it has intensified since my brother and his friend went in there. Apparently now it's being remodeled and reopened. I hope they cleansed that building of any negative energies and spirits first, but somehow I doubt it. My second story takes place a few years after the incident with the little girl at my sweet 16. My parents threw me a surprise party with a luau theme I had a few of my close friends over, some staying overnight. One of my friends, let's call her Cat, needed to go home, so we all decided to walk her home. I mean, she didn't live that far, maybe two or three blocks at most. Well, we get there and we're all hanging out. Cat lived near a cemetery, and another friend who I'll call Sam suggested that we just walk around for a little bit. Now, it's maybe 9.30 at night. This cemetery has been known to have fog only in the cemetery. Fog that doesn't affect the area outside of its cobblestone walls. I didn't tell anyone, of course, and we all thought it would be a great idea. So we all hop over the wall, which really isn't that tall, and we just start walking around, looking at who's buried there. In this cemetery, there is an area that has its own fence, and after a while, Sam and I get a little bored and decided we wanted to go inside, so we did, and immediately she starts feeling sick to her stomach and we can't figure out why. So we tell everybody still in the cemetery and we leave. The second we leave, Sam is feeling better. No nausea, no stomach pain, nothing. Then I started feeling nauseous, which freaked me out a little bit. So I convinced everyone to go back to my house, because I didn't want to be around that place anymore. We told Cat goodbye, and we left. I didn't stop feeling nauseous until we were inside my house. I don't think whatever was in there wanted us there. And I'm glad that all that ever happened to me was a wave of nausea. I assume it could have been a lot worse. My father's house is a creepy one. It isn't secluded, as we had many neighbors, but it was by no means in a suburb, if you get what I mean. This story is about my father's first experience, and also my first experience with the paranormal. My father is a skeptical man when it comes to the paranormal. Skeptical meaning that if something is explainable, he won't bother with it. That fact is what makes everything I'm about to tell you so much more terrifying. As he used to work graveyard shift for the school district in our town, he would sleep during the day. Back when this incident happened, we only had a cheap futon for a couch. The futon had a metal frame with a dingy cover as the cushion portion of it, and the back of the futon, when locked up into a couch, had vertical, hollow bars. He told me that one day, while everyone was away at either work or school, 
He was having trouble sleeping and was awake for about an hour before being able to fall back asleep. He told me that while he was laying there trying to convince himself to sleep, he heard someone open our front door, but he never heard it close. It's a finicky door, so you have to slam it to get it actually closed. Essentially, he would have had to have heard someone close it. He had a reason to believe it was his girlfriend, now ex, coming home from work early for lunch and he thought nothing of it. While he's waiting for her to come to the bedroom, he suddenly hears heavy footsteps walk around what he believes is our living room and slowly run their fingers, theoretically, across the back of our futon. This is where the description earlier comes in. What he thought was fingers ran across the back of the futon. There's a distinct metallic thunk, thunk, thunk when someone does this. It's not mistakable for anything else in the house. It's the only object that could make that sound. He immediately thinks that it's an intruder and rushes into the living room, but no one is there. The door is wide open and nobody's anywhere in the house. I should also mention that we have a deck made of wood that has a flight of stairs leading down to the ground level. Also, the walls are paper thin. You can hear anything from one place in the house to another. I can hear my father sneeze when he's in his room while I'm in the living room. This means that he would have had to have heard, or at least seen, somebody walk out the front door and down the stairs to leave the house, and he did not. This experience had him on edge for months. He tried talking to whatever manifested in the house and taking pictures of it, just to get some sense of closure from that day. As for my encounter, when I was a teenager, my sisters and I would hang out in our bathroom to talk and whatnot. Don't ask why, it was a thing for us for some reason. One particular day, one of my sisters and I were in there talking to each other when we heard somebody sprinting down the hall. It's a very short hallway, so it didn't phase us when it stopped abruptly at the end of the hall. We were on edge, as we thought it was our younger sister and we didn't want to get in trouble. As mentioned, my father worked nights and he would be upset when woken up while sleeping. So I open the door and as soon as I do, this huge gust of wind hits me in the face. Like, you know, if someone's running past you. I look out into the living room and see my father's now ex sitting on the futon watching television. I asked her where my sister was and she pointed next to her and motioned that she was sleeping. I asked if she had just heard that running and she gave me a funny look. As my heart sank, I slowly closed the door and looked at my sister, who was frozen with fear. We both knew what it was, and didn't really mention it for a while. We didn't want to make the story feel any more real than it already did. So, this happened around seven years ago in 2012 or 2013. I started high school and the place I attended was in a different city from my hometown, so I stayed in the school's dorm. The place was on the outskirts of the city. It was a large area with two school buildings, two separated PE buildings, a study hall, a kitchen and cafeteria, and the dorm. It was a custom for freshmen to stay in the big bedrooms, the ones that could host up to 12 people. In the room that I was staying in, there were only seven girls, including me, throughout the whole year. Seven is a bad number in my country, similar to how some people don't like 13. Through the school year, we experienced really weird things happening. Every month, we gathered a handful of screws that weren't missing from anywhere. We found weird candy wrappings, old style ones that nobody had had in the room. Once, three of us had to go home during the week because all of us had had some sort of accident. One time, our lock broke, which locked half of the group out, 
and the other half in. The room was separated into three sections, and all three had double windows. One time, the middle inside window broke during the day, and there were just a lot of other small things that happened. We usually joked about them, even though we were all a bit uneasy, because they were happening so often. And because they were so frequent, we just shrugged them off. Then, the scariest thing happened. It was March 13th. I remember this vividly because we have a national holiday on the 15th and that meant a long weekend. One of my roommates was a sleep talker and she usually fell asleep before everyone. We had a habit of making fun of her a bit because it was always gibberish to us. Well, not that night. She fell asleep pretty early and talked about her boyfriend in her sleep. We silently laughed at her and after a while the others went to bed. Three other girls and I were sleeping in the last section, far from the door. We pushed together three beds and slept cuddled up most of the night. I was sleeping on one end of the beds, and the sleep-talking girl, Henriette, on the other end. There were two other girls between us, Yvette and Ata. I almost fell asleep when Ata let out a small scream next to me. I quickly sat up and saw that Henny was pulling Yvette's ponytail and was choking her. We quickly get her hands off of Yvette and cuddled up on the bed, trying to stay away from her while calling her name, hoping that she would wake, but she didn't. Then she started to talk to us about, quote, the people who were locked up in the attic. She was talking about how they were free now and they were getting closer. She told us that these people would kill us all. By that time, everyone in the room was freaking out. The girls in front kept telling her to cut it out, but the people in the back, where I was, we feared for our lives. I'm not a religious person anymore, but I was back then. So at one point, I started to quietly pray, hugging the two sobbing girls. I didn't even say two lines when Henny said in a menacing voice, Don't pray. That won't help you. One of the girls in the front screamed and turned the light on. It took us five minutes at least to wake up Henny, and when she woke up, she seemed terrified and started to cry and kept asking us what had happened. I left that school at the end of the school year, but that night still haunts me. When I was a little girl of about 10 or so, I would always go shopping with my aunt for my birthday. But this particular time was a little different. She wanted me to stay the night and then go shopping the next day. I agreed to do this because who doesn't love going shopping with your aunt as a kid? I was always creeped out by her house for the longest time before I stayed that night. My dad and brother have had experiences before me. They always camped out in the backyard in the woods. She had a big place, a house, a barn, a pool, even a pond, and lots of land. Sounds perfect, right? Anyway, they said that they saw a fog surrounding the house. Not the barn or anything else, but just the house. Creepy. And they also heard things in the woods, too. Yes, I am thinking what you're thinking, it was most likely animals. The fog was harder to explain. Either way, I figured that they were just trying to scare me, so I didn't think too much of it when the opportunity to stay there at night came up. Let's get on to that experience. I was up in the bedroom, right at the top of the stairs. If you walked straight up the stairs, you could walk straight into the bedroom. The catch to the bedroom is that it had a baby gate on it, so it was very hard to get in and out quickly. There was a home office to the left of the stairs, and then to the right, there was like another living room area with an old time bedroom connected to it with dolls and glass tea sets. Oddly enough, that's the room that I felt the safest in. Off of the living room area was a long hallway that led to my aunt and uncle's room. I was laying in bed watching my favorite movie, Mary Poppins. 
It was at least 9 p.m. at night. Bedtime for a child like me, right? I fell asleep during the movie. I woke up with the TV off and to a room that was completely pitch black. The door was open and I could barely see the staircase leading down. I tried to close my eyes so that I wouldn't be so scared, but what happened next, I can never forget. I heard footsteps coming up the stairs, and they weren't heavy, so I knew that they weren't my aunt or uncle. In fact, it sounded like a child walking up the steps. I hid under the covers and hoped that it would go away. The footsteps came all the way up the stairs, across the room, and stood right next to my bed. I tried very hard to be still and quiet. Finally, the entity turned away, and I heard the little steps go back down the stairs. I was really relieved until I heard them ascend the staircase once more. I was so scared I wanted to scream for my aunt, but she was so far away she wouldn't have been able to hear me anyway. It came back into the room again. As I hid under the covers for the second time, it came and stopped by the other side of the bed, closest to me. I felt it tug on my blanket, and then it turned away and walked back down the stairs. So this time I got smart, or stupid. I don't know, you can decide that for yourself. Once I heard that it was far enough away, I jumped out of bed. I opened the baby gate, and I ran all the way to my aunt and uncle's room and crawled into bed with them. Let me tell you, I scared the crap out of them. Once they finally made room for me, I got all cozy, but I couldn't sleep. Anyway, it was about a minute after I got into bed with them that I heard the baby gate slam. I was so terrified, but at least I was with my aunt and uncle. The next morning, I woke up in their bed alone upstairs. Now, you might not believe this, but I don't really care if you do or not, but I woke up to three scratches on my chest and they were very painful. To this day, nobody really believes me that it happened, besides my best friend. This event still haunts me. I don't really talk to people about it because nobody ever believes me and I don't want to get ridiculed, but I just had to vent. Whatever it was, I still don't know. A demon posing as a child? Probably. Something evil? That's for sure. But I guess I'll never really know. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boars and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there you'd have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road, then drive about an hour up the mountain, off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin, and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding glass door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room. No doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot, not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there. Mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling very vulnerable. At some point during that trip, my cousin, sister, and I started to wander around the outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing in small lava tubes to see if we could find something. 
The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but small, hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flow and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and can tell that it's a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say, be careful what you wish for, because one lava tube in particular had something in it. We smashed one, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones, sitting on long, brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but some kind of animal. Maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to it. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there. There was really no physical way that a person could have put those there. Why didn't it get destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it. The only explanation we could think of was that it was an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we probably shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asked us if anybody had gone to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, weird, he said. I woke up and saw someone standing at the sliding door. I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other horrified, like, what if it was the person that left the offerings and we totally disturbed it and were screwed? We asked for more details. He said it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man and that he just stood there at the door staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and that they were mad at me. It could have been a human, but given our location, it seems really unlikely. There were no other cabins or homes built on those hunting grounds. And you'd have to know exactly where it was if you went up there to camp. It's not somewhere that people would just stumble upon. Either way, I have never stayed there again. I work at a small 48-bed hospital. These experiences happen in or near the decommissioned psych wing. IT, in which I work, was moved to this wing, into old patient rooms. At first, I'd hear my name called, often from down the hall or from empty rooms. Thinking someone needed tech support, I would try to locate the caller, but there was never anyone there. Many times I would see people in empty rooms, a patient on a bed, a doctor in a white lab coat next to them. As this was a decommissioned wing, it made me turn around to investigate, only to find the rooms empty. Frequently, there was a male and a female walking together, apparently talking to each other, and they would turn into the room next to mine. I would follow them, only to find that they had entered a room through a closed door and no one was inside. It was always the same room, too. One afternoon, on a Saturday, I got called in while my four-year-old daughter and I were downtown. I headed over, but was unable to unlock the notoriously problematic back door to our wing. However, I saw a man coming down the hallway toward me, and I knocked on the door and motioned that I was locked out. He appeared to look right at me, but instead of coming to my aid, made a right-hand turn into the office next to mine. I quickly leaned forward to better see, and hurriedly knocked on the door, thinking he hadn't seen or heard me, only to realize the door to that office was closed. Confused, I thought maybe I had just seen a reflection in the window from behind me, and turned, asked my daughter if anyone had walked up behind us, and she said no. I was able to get the door open finally, 
and the office was empty. Another time, our wing was fully occupied due to a remodel which displaced some staff. I heard what I thought was a metal cart coming down the hall, and then a tremendous crash like a dozen pots and pans hitting a tile floor. I jumped up and ran into the hallway, partly to assist, and partly to make sure nobody was hurt. No one on our floor had heard anything. There was no cart, and no disaster. Next, I was called in on New Year's Eve, before midnight. The issue took about 20 minutes to resolve, and since I was going to miss the festivities anyway, I thought I would document my time and head home. Upon entering my office, I noticed the bathroom door was open several inches, which I always keep closed. This wasn't a big deal. Housekeeping had probably left it open while cleaning up. For some reason, I did not close it as I normally would have during the day. As I typed up the incident, a man exited my bathroom. At first I thought perhaps my boss had come to investigate as well, but then why would he have been in my office? As I looked up, the man, just over six feet tall and thin, looked over at me in shock, as I must have been doing to him, and then he disappeared. Considering the hour, I noped out of there without finishing my report. The old TVs in the rooms of this wing would sometimes turn on by themselves, just static, as they had no feeds, but I had to unlock empty patient rooms and turn off the televisions occasionally, always with the volume turned up to the max. One other co-worker has told me that he has heard his name called when no one is there, has seen the woman walking down the hall but without the man, and the doctor by the bedside, but that's all. Many people will report hearing things they can't explain, but no one else has told me that they can see anything. The rest of the hospital has no abnormal activity that we know of. Here are some of my family stories from Ireland. I was about 17 years old, living at my mom's house. I was just finishing secondary school for my trade in painting. A few of my friends and I from school decided to go out and celebrate our upcoming graduation with drinks. I said, haven't we been celebrating graduation all year? And I got a laugh from the boys. We went out to the pub and did what we did every night, drink. Now, on school and work nights, I kept my wits about me, knowing that I had to get up in the morning. Not only that, but the bars back home didn't stay open until 2 or 4 a.m. They'd put you out at about 12, and maybe you'd get lucky and get a crowd in on a Friday or Saturday, and they'd keep you there to make a bit of money. The night went as usual, and I watched the first two of the group say their goodbyes, grab their jackets and hats, and then head out into the dark. Now, you have to remember, Ireland is still a poor country by the standards of the EU and was even worse off than today when I was a teenager in the 70s. Some of the people I grew up with had no plumbing, most used fireplaces to heat the house, and a couple had no electricity. So when I say they headed into the dark, there were no street lights for miles and there was very limited artificial light. I looked at the clock on the wall, it was 10.30. About 20 minutes passed since the pair had left, and I asked my friend Jerry if he was coming home, since he lived only a few minutes up the road from me. He replied, I'm having a good crack, I'll see you tomorrow. So I left him and headed out myself. The walk from the pub to my house was about two miles or about a 40 minute walk. I said my goodbyes and started out. For some reason, I felt uneasy. I didn't know what was wrong. But walking the dark roads, I walked every night, every day, my whole life, put a knot in my stomach on this night. I got halfway up the road, looked back, and thought about waiting for Jerry to head home with me. I knew Jerry was the kind to stay until closing, and I didn't have the money or the energy to keep up with him until payday. So I turned around, reassured myself, and kept walking. About ten minutes into my walk, I heard rustling in the bushes along the road. It sounded big, and I assumed it was a deer. 
I kept on, and about halfway home, I heard the rustling in the bushes behind me again, followed by a stone hitting me in the head. I turned quickly and said, Quit it, guys, now. Come out. I don't want to be walking the whole way alone. My heart sank. My friends, who I expected to come out of the bushes, didn't. I was met instead with an eerie silence. I turned around, told myself I'd just had a bit too much to drink, and kept walking. Five minutes later, I heard footsteps behind me. They were keeping pace with my own. This time I darted around and yelled, The joke's gone on long enough, come out now. Again, where I expected to see or hear my friends, I was met with an eerie silence. I turned and picked up the pace then immediately heard the footsteps, still keeping pace with my own. I stopped dead in my tracks, and so did the footsteps. And then, I ran as fast as I could. And again, the footsteps kept pace, only this time they were getting closer and closer to me instead of keeping the same distance like they had before. My heart was racing, and I finally saw the bridge to the brook and ran across. Then the footsteps stopped, but I didn't. I ran all the way home. When I got home, my mother was sitting by the fire. I sat down next to her out of breath and shaking and she asked me what happened. I told her and she replied, you're lucky you got to the brook, ghosts can't cross water. The ghost never even crossed my mind until she said that. I even asked my friends at school the next day if it was them and said, you really had me going. But I was met with puzzled faces. Later, I found out the last three of the group didn't even leave until closing, almost an hour after I started out home. It may not have been a ghost, but what's scarier is truly not knowing what it was at all. My grandmother is one of those people who seems to just be naturally susceptible to paranormal activity. She's in her late 70s and has numerous stories about all sorts of spooky and unexplainable encounters she's had throughout her life. She used to keep me entertained for hours with me getting her to constantly tell and retell her stories again and again. It's the way she tells them, I think, that really invokes a sense of fear. Hopefully, I can do her justice with my recounts, as she's not quite up to speed on Reddit. The house she grew up in throughout the 50s was haunted, undoubtedly. We'll start with the time that she was walking home from school as a 10-year-old girl. She grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, in a typical city-style terraced house, maybe 50 houses joined together on a long, narrow street. There was no one immediately around her as she walked home from school one brisk January afternoon, except for one gentleman walking maybe 20 yards in front of her. He was wearing a long black overcoat with a bowler hat, not something that would raise any eyebrows at the time. Suddenly, my grandmother noticed the man stop in front of her house, open the little gate at the front of the small garden, walk the five yards down the path to her front door, open it, and enter the house. Still, she thought nothing of this, simply assuming the man was a friend of her parents, or a colleague of her father's of some kind. Oddly, however, when she got to the front door and went to open it not moments after the man, the door was locked. She thought this strange, as the man had just pushed it open and walked in. Not too weird, though, right? Someone may have just locked the door behind him. What was strange, however, was that upon entering the house not 45 seconds after the man in black did, she found herself to be the only one in the house. No parents, no man in black, nobody. My grandmother often speaks of the noises she used to hear lying in her bed at night. And by noises, I mean a horrible, blood-curdling wheeze, coming from, of all places, directly under her bed. She described it as the long, drawn-out breaths that you would imagine coming from a 90-year-old, 40-a-day smoker on their deathbed. This would happen night after night after night. She used to run downstairs to tell her mother about the man under her bed, but her mother was a stern Christian woman and would have nothing to do with it, often scolding her and sending her back to bed. 
for telling the devil's tales. She explains how she used to just cover her head with blankets and pray for the wheeze to stop, crying herself to sleep most nights. The last story that I'll mention for now again takes place in the same house. My great-grandfather was a policeman and often worked in a regular shift pattern. The house had a small hallway upon entering the front door, around five by five foot, just large enough for a coat rack and the stairs to begin. Immediately to your right when entering the front door was the living room. Most evenings after dinner, my grandmother would sit in the living room and listen to the radio with her sister while her mother knitted or sewed. Rather regularly, they would hear the front door unlock, open and close, the hall light switch flick on, and the rustle and knock of a coat being removed and thrown on the coat rack. My great-grandmother would say, oh, that must be your father home, or something of the sort, before going to greet him in the hallway. On numerous occasions, though, they wouldn't be able to find him immediately and they would assume that he'd gone upstairs. They would go upstairs to welcome him home, but to no avail. There would also be no coat on the rack. And then, 15 or 20 minutes later, her father would arrive home. It just so happens that my grandmother found out years after moving out of that house that a single man had lived there alone for years and died in the very room that she slept in as a child. Apparently, he had some kind of respiratory condition. My family home is 30-ish years old, and some strange things have happened in it. This happened in 2009, and we still don't have a clear explanation for it. In the house, some slightly strange things happened, like the radio and TV going on and off, and random doors opening. Lots of cracked mirrors and what sounds like voices but I live in Ireland and it's quite windy a lot, so I put those things down to that and the odd surge of electricity or something. The one standout thing is from when my sister was finishing school. I think high school is the equivalent in the US. She's an excellent student and she wanted to go on to get into a course that's pretty hard to get into for uni, so she was under a bit of pressure. In her room, there was a long mirror hanging in between two windows. The end of her bed came to the end of the window, and there is a section of wall where the mirror hangs, so it's hanging over the floor. The head of the bed is about six-ish feet or more away from the mirror. The mirror was pretty heavy and strung up on cord and hanging on the wall. One night, she was dreaming and in the dream, she saw a woman. As soon as she saw her, she said she felt an evil feeling and immediately knew that she shouldn't have seen her. Then, she woke up to the mirror smashing over her. She was screaming so much my parents came running, thinking that something terrible had happened. Her face and arms were cut, and to be honest, she was pretty traumatized. This room is now my bedroom because she's too afraid to sleep in it. My parents couldn't figure out how that mirror came off the wall and broke over her. The cord at the back was undamaged and the mirror is pretty heavy, so it's unlikely that she would have been able to lift it up off the hook herself and then over her head. Everyone was really freaked out and we all slept in the same room that night, even my dad who in no way believes in the supernatural. We spoke about it the next day and agreed not to talk about it outside the family so people wouldn't keep asking my sister about it. Plus, she was terrified and couldn't really talk about it anyway. To this day, she still can't talk about it and even writing this and remembering it makes me not want to sleep in my parents' house for a while. About four months after it happened, my sister was doing work experience after her finals with my mom's friend who's a psychologist. She had a local handyman in around her home, which was also where her office is. He met my sister for a few minutes in the kitchen one day when she was taking a break, 
And then they both went on about their days. Later that night, my mom's friend called to our house to discuss something with my mom. She said the handyman had told her that there was something dark with my sister, that it was a woman the same age as her that couldn't move on and who had come to my sister through a mirror. He said that she needed help. Apparently he sees things but doesn't really talk about it as it freaks him out, but he felt that this was important. My mom immediately asked my dad and I if we had told anybody, and we hadn't. So there's absolutely no way that that man, or my mom's friend, could have known about what had happened with the mirror. We still have no explanation for what happened, and mirrors in our house are constantly cracking. There isn't a bad energy in the house or anything, but I do have to sleep with a light on at home, and normally I like sleeping in the dark. As a note, a man was pushed in front of a train adjacent to our land, and there was an old woman that lived in a hut thing until she died, after which our house was built and we moved in. I don't know if that has anything to do with what happened. Apart from that, it's a normal house. Most of these experiences are second-hand. They mostly happened to my best friend at the house he used to live in. I had one experience in the house, and I'll start with that because it's the least interesting. The stuff that happened to my friend is much more difficult to explain. This happened when I was around 21, four years ago. I was picking up my friend so we could go out to a movie and I had come inside to hang out in the kitchen with his mom while he finished getting ready. It was already dark out, and the house was mostly dark too. Only the light from the kitchen was on. I got tired of waiting for him, so I decided to head out to my car to listen to music while I waited. I walked down the darkened hallway toward the front door. The way the house was situated, the front sitting room was off to the right as you walked toward the door. In that room, against the wall, was a couch, and over it, a large oval mirror. As I walked past the sitting room, I was overcome with this feeling of dread. I knew that I had to keep my eyes straight ahead on the front door, and that if I turned my head to the right and looked in the mirror, I would see something that shouldn't be there, something that would give me nightmares. I practically ran out the front door. Later, when I told my friend about that feeling, he just sort of nodded sagely and said, Yeah, I don't look in that mirror. That's the only experience I've ever had with the paranormal. And let's face it, it was really just a frightening feeling in a dark house, and mirrors are creepy anyway. But my friend swears up and down that the following experiences are true. And since he's generally very honest, rational, and not attention-seeking, I believe him. I have no proof, just his words that I choose to believe are the truth. My friend believes there were at least two spirits in that house. One was benevolent, the other less so. And there were a few experiences that seemed to be isolated incidents. He says that he would sometimes see a woman's face in his closet. She was the nice spirit. He said that she seemed like she was just there, watching over him, that she never spoke, just appeared sometimes and watched him. The other spirit was not so kind. My friend says that he would often feel as though something were following him down the long hallway that led from the bedrooms to the kitchen. On one occasion, he says that he tripped over something hard, but when he looked down, the hallway was devoid of any object that could have caused him to trip. On another occasion, he felt something like claws scratch his calf while walking down the same hallway. Again, there was nothing around that could have caused such a sensation. This last experience is the one that I think is the creepiest of all, the one for which I have absolutely no explanation. My best friend and two of our other friends were sitting in the front room, the same room with the couch and the creepy mirror. They were just watching TV and chatting. 
Suddenly, my best friend noticed that they were not alone in the room. Sitting in a chair that was only moments before completely empty was a man he had never seen before. He was dressed in an old-fashioned, think 1940s, suit and hat. He says the man had a beard and that he didn't speak or look at them. He just sat there. He stared at the man, stunned. After a minute or two, the man faded away. This is the part that really freaked me out. My other friend who was in the room saw him too. And both friends later described him the exact same way. The third friend only saw an empty chair. I'm sure there are logical explanations for some or maybe all of these things, but I don't know how to explain these things. I'm just passing along some stories that I hope somebody will find interesting. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind, the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town shut it down and just lay down on the snow, looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence would be the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, and it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be introspective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field and things like that. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was just the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was that there must be an animal nearby, in which case I needed to get out of there fast. You really don't want to mess with a wild animal out there. But the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was a fairly mechanical sound. Again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me laterally. It was coming from above me. So naturally, I look up, determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I noticed something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like somebody started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. And then it stops. The lights are gone. The clicking disappears. And aside from being a little stiff and cold and rather petrified, I'm fine. So, I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry. But soon it's running, and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what just occurred are running through my head. 
I'm thinking that it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior. Probably not that big of a deal. I pull up to my house. The lights are all dark. Strange. It wasn't that late when I left. I open the outer door as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear, and enter the inner door. The house is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late, marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anybody noticing. Proves to be pretty easy and soon I'm under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day. And all of a sudden, everything makes sense. The engine being hard to start. Being stiff. Being colder than I thought I should be. Nobody being up when I was gone what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 p.m. when I left, but now it was creeping up on 6 a.m. I stood staring at clicking lights for nearly seven hours. I never did end up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late snow machine rides anymore. This story isn't mine, but I always thought that it was really interesting, and I recently got permission to tell it. It's strange, but entirely true. Whether you believe it or not, I hope you at least find it interesting too. In the 2000s, my mom, out of nowhere, experienced some unusual occurrences, which I suppose could be described as visions. It only happened a handful of times, and with a pretty large time gap in between them. Each vision was only a few seconds long, during which a vivid and lifelike image or moving scene would gradually materialize in front of her. It lasted long enough for her to see it, and then it dissipated. In the first, in 2000, she was in a cafe at Christmas time and was admiring a fellow customer's long blonde hair, when suddenly she saw her in a casket with her hair tied in a braid. It was so jarring that she left shortly afterward, disturbed by what she had seen and unable to find a cause for it. In the second experience in 2005, she was in a meeting with her attorney, and a scene began playing to the left of her desk, showing the woman in a garden of flowers, dressed in soft, light-colored clothing and glowing with pure happiness, as if she had an aura around her. My mom felt that although it was awkward, she couldn't leave without knowing and decided to tell her what she had seen. The attorney, who had throughout the meeting been very professional but unmoved by anything, was so stunned that she got tears in her eyes and confirmed that it was true. She loved flowers and was happiest when gardening. The third and final time this happened was in 2008, which is my favorite story and the one that I find most interesting. We moved to a new house that year an odd place in that the house itself was tiny, but there was a disproportionately large backyard and a lawn running about 50 feet wide and 140 feet long. At the very end, there was a small embankment or grassy knoll directly behind which sat a canal of water, like the kind that people sail barges down for fun. It was the first time that we had ever lived so close to a body of water and we would watch people sail their boats there on weekends, feed bread to the passing ducks, all was well. But then there came another vision, this time about the water. She was sitting on her bed one morning, just thinking about her day, when a scene began materializing before her. Only unlike the other two, she was a part of this one and not just a spectator. In it, she was a young child who found herself running down to the bottom of our yard one night in order to see the boat that was sailing by. She ran all the way down, just in time to catch the boat as it came past. A 1920s-style riverboat, all lit up, similar to the kind that were popular in the southern states. She said that she felt strongly like it was a regular occurrence, running down to catch the boat as it passed, like something she did every week. The boat did not sail on the water of the canal, which of course would have been too shallow, 
but almost appeared to float as if there was a deeper body of water sitting above the real one. She could see the faces of the people on the boat with perfect clarity, watching them as they waved to her like they knew her. There were women in dresses with parasols and the sound of saloon-style pianos, honky-tonk or something similar. It was like a party was in full swing, she said, everybody having a ball. When the boat had almost fully passed and the vision began to dissolve, my mom's overriding thought afterward was, how could a riverboat fit on a barge canal? She found the whole experience thoroughly eerie, much more than the other two visions and can still remember the faces and music even now, more than a decade on from the event. She has no connection to the states in which riverboats were popular during that time, being European born and raised, nor any interest in that particular time boat nor riverboats, though she's thoroughly creeped out by them to this day. We were playing a game recently in which a riverboat appeared, and it unsettled her so much that she quit playing. I know it might all mean nothing, and could just be a random glitch of the imagination, or a trick of the mind, or something. But I find the details very compelling, especially the part about being a child. I hope somebody has some input on it, but either way, I hope you enjoyed the story. I was 16 years old and already at boarding school for roughly five years. My boarding school was situated in buildings that were originally used as convents for priests, and it was also used as a graveyard in the Middle Ages. It has now been around for over 170 years as a school, going through two world wars, during which it was also used as a field hospital by the German army. Now, the thing you should know about the boarding school is that it was located in two large buildings, separated by a large playground. The boarding school itself was located on the top floors of each building, separated by three floors to reach the ground floor. I didn't have good grades that year, and I was moved over to the other building of the boarding school, with the junior years, to be under a stricter routine and longer study hours. We always had about an hour and 15 minutes every evening to relax and spend time with friends after studying. For that, there was a large basement with a small TV room with a bar and a gigantic room with pool tables and kicker tables. The thing about the gigantic room was that it only had a single light switch and it was connected to the school's theater and dancing room, of which the doors were always locked. The light was also always off. Besides that, there was also a door that was always locked and supposedly connected the two buildings on the school's premises via a tunnel. Now, that evening, I went down to the basement directly after studying, taking along my phone charger. It was a pretty uneventful night and at the end of it, I went up the stairs, going up three floors and finally reaching my room. All of a sudden, I realized that I had forgotten my charger in the basement, so I ran up to the supervisor who gave me the keys so I could go down and get it. I was descending the three floors to reach the basement, and I started to get this eerie feeling of being watched. The feeling got even worse once I realized that if I would scream down there, nobody would hear me. There were three empty floors between myself and the boarding school. Once I reached the basement level, I was calm again, unlocking the first door and opening the second one. As I slowly opened the second door, it felt as if the darkness in the gigantic room was extremely thick, as if it would swallow me. I know it's weird, but that's how it felt. I switched on the lights and started making my way past the ping pong tables toward the back of the gigantic room, about 30 meters away from the door and the only light switch. As I made my way back, I was suddenly overtaken by a massive sense of danger and terror. I felt as if I was being ambushed or led into a trap and my heart rate skyrocketed. I quickly turned around and speed walked back to the door when suddenly all the ping pong tables were making extremely loud noises as if people were slamming on them with their fists to stir up a fight. I started sprinting toward the door in fear that someone might switch off the lights or close the door on me and while I was getting closer to the door the noises got louder and louder. 
Once I finally reached it, I switched off the light and slammed the door shut. And as soon as the door closed, the noise stopped. I quickly locked the door and ran upstairs as fast as I could, as if my life depended on it. I crashed into one of the supervisors making his way home at the end of the night. He asked me what I was doing and why I was so pale and sweaty and shaking, and I told him what I had experienced. Instead of trying to rationalize what happened, the first thing he said is that he experienced some scary things as well when he had to lock up the basement alone. He also told me to check with another supervisor to make sure nobody was down there. The other supervisor and I went down to the basement again and stopped at the locked door, trying to hear if somebody was down there or if any students were messing around. We listened to quietly and heard someone walking around. As soon as we opened the door, the noise stopped. We turned on the lights, but nobody was there. Nevertheless, the back doors of the dancing room and theater were wide open. To this day, I get chills thinking back to this experience. Nobody could have been down there with me without me noticing them. I can't explain away the slamming noises coming from the pool tables. It's an experience that has never left me, and although I try to rationalize it, it's sort of haunting me in a way.